afternoon. Good morning to all the folks in Boston. Uh, welcome to the second session now of our lower extremity trauma course in Libya. Uh, this is a virtual education conference and this week we'll be doing ankle trauma. Uh, so again, these are our uh, course chairs. We went over this last time, so I won't, uh, won't do this again. But thanks again to our HGOC organizing committee, um, Dr. Sohail, Dr. Aaron, Dr. Jason, Kush, and Sam for all their hard work putting this conference together. Really the credit for all the organization goes to the team. Uh, so this is the agenda for today. We'll have uh, just a quick little intro from me and then we'll jump right into the journal club and the case presentations. Uh, we've got a lot of cases to get through today, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, again, just Zoom etiquette, very briefly, wonderful to see all your faces. So please, if you feel comfortable, turn on your video. Um, but if you're not speaking, please keep your mic microphone muted. Uh, it'll just help us all with the conversation, keep focused. Um, the chat is open to all of you uh, for answering questions, for asking questions, typing responses, comments, anything like that. Um, if you would like to make a comment on the air, just simply raise your hand. And that goes for the faculty as well as the, the residents and the trainees. Please, you know, we would love to hear from the, the, the trainees. If you have a question that you would like to ask, either type it in the chat or, uh, or raise your hand and say it live. Uh, this conference is for you, so please feel free to share and comment and ask lots of questions. So again, these are our course objectives. This is all about improving knowledge, but also fostering international discussion and motivating the younger generation of orthopedic surgeons in Libya and beyond. We have people on the conference from many countries, actually, not just Libya. Um, so this is our course structure, as we have described previously. Week one was foot fractures. This week is ankle fractures, including pylon fractures. So here we are on the ninth. And next week, we'll be doing tibia fractures, lower extremity reconstruction. Uh, again, this is the structure, recorded lectures, articles, and supplemental articles. Um, I hope that everybody's finding, uh, finding it easy to access this. All of the links are in those uh, uh, supplemental, all the supplemental articles, everything. The links are in those PDFs that we are sending out. It's the learning plans that we're sending that should have all of the details. So we had some really fantastic recorded lectures this week uh, from Dr. D Dr. Daniel Gus, Dr. Lorena Bejerano Pineda, uh, Dr. Armen Kalikian, and Dr. Gregory Warias. Uh, I hope that you guys all got a chance to watch these videos. I certainly learned a lot from all of them. Uh, and so this is our session today. Uh, we're gonna be talking about ankle fractures, pylon fractures, ankle fusions, and a little bit about ankle arthroscopy. Uh, so without further ado, why don't we just jump right into the Journal Club, unless there are any questions or comments before we do so. No? Okay. All right. Let's jump right into the Journal Club. Uh, so the first um, paper that we had was uh, Holzbrecken, uh, the non-operative treatment of the medial malleolus, um, and it was an RCT. So Dr. Zayad uh, Aldaibani and uh, Dr. Ahmad Saad. Uh, if you guys would like to take it away, please go for it. Uh, uh, hello. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Ziad is still uh, not available uh, right now. Uh, can can we start with the next one then? Yes, then, of course. Uh, no, no problem. Let, let's jump then to the comparison of early and delayed open reduction internal fixation of uh, pylon fractures. Uh, so that's Dr. Tariq uh, Abomais and uh, Dr. Makwazum. Anybody available to talk about this article? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Oh, would you like to? Are you trying to share your screen? Yes, please. Can I give permission? Yes. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, can we give permission to share that screen? Okay, now. Yes. <laughs> Here. Okay. okay. Nice to meet you today. Uh, no, I, I think I didn't show your screen. Uh, we need to share my screen. 
Can I give permission, uh, Dr. Kiran, to him? Yeah, I think I think you should have permission now. Is that right, Aaron? I'm okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. 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 Now. Uh, okay. Slide. Okay. Uh, nice to meet you today. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I would introduce this uh, journal club. Uh, comparison of the early and delayed open reduction and then of trade, uh, treating closed tibial bilum fracture. Uh, background, a tibial bilum fracture is typically caused by highly energy axial force, and is often accompanied by severe soft tissue damage. For an optimal outcome, there should be an anatomic joint reconstruction, restoration of the distal table alignment, and fracture stabilization uh, to facilitate union. Uh, study objective. The aim of the study was the, to determine the outcome of uh, early and delayed of open reduction at the turn of session for the close type C bilum fracture. Uh, study design, retrospective uh, com comparative study, level of the evidence level three, inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, was inclusion criteria, uh, unilateral, type C closed the bilum fracture, age from 18 to 65 years, over reduction term fixation treatment and follow up for at least one year. Uh, exclusion criteria, open fracture, pathologic fracture, other fractures affecting the target and ankle joint rehabilitation, soft tissue injury, grade four, or uh, compartment syndrome, uh, severe neurovascular insufficiency, diabetic ca cancer, and immune deficiency. Method, uh, 46 patient uh, with close type C bilum, uh, bilum fracture, matched according to the age, gender, soft tissue, condition, and Fractured pattern were divided into group A, early group underwent surgery with, within 36 hours of the injury, or group B, delayed group underwent surgery 10 day, days to three weeks post injury after the soft tissue swelling subsides. In the delayed group, nine patients were uh, treated first by temporary external fixator, all the closed fracture were managed by over reduction with looking blade. At follow up, the clinical and radiographic results were retrospectively analyzed. The mean follow up time was uh, 25.8 months, range 14 to 45, 48 months in group A and 26 months, range 15 to 45 months in group B. Operative technique, all fractures were treated with over reduction term fixation under tourniquet by two senior trauma surgeons. Minor invasive technique were used for these fracture if visible. Border approach to achieve such satisfactory reduction was used as needed according to the fracture battle. Result. There was no significant difference between the two groups regarding the rate of the soft tissue complication, the rate of the fracture union, and the final functional score. The patient in group A had a significantly shorter mean time to fracture union, 21.5 uh, weeks versus 23.3 uh, weeks, also shorter of operating time. And hospital stay 7.6 days, versus 15.2 days. Discussion. The optimal surgery time for the, to introduce my colleague is complete this. Uh, thanks, Dr. Arka. Good evening and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for our doctors uh, for the, this nice uh, education conference. And this article is uh, did by orthopedic uh, department. Uh, of South, uh, the, South uh, China, uh, Chiwan University, and published by American Orthopedic uh, Foot and Ankle uh, 
this uh, this uh, in this uh, paper we we want to comment uh, about uh, some points such as uh, long uh, period of uh, long period of follow up and uh, uh, sample size and uh, type of study i want uh, i will uh, take it uh, later okay discussion discussion of this paper the optimal surgery time uh, optimal time of surgery for tibia bone fraction remains controversial and this study compared uh, the outcomes of early or and delayed or in treating cross type c tibia bone fractures strength of study long term of follow up Based on the retrospective control matched the gathered data, selection bias was not avoided, sample size was relatively, relatively small. Conclusion. Conclusion, uh, if, so, uh, if soft tissue conditions are acceptable early or if for treating closed type C epilum fracture can be safe and effective with better results, uh, with similar rates of one complication. Uh, fracture reunion and uh, final good uh, functional recovery, but shorter operative time, union time, and hospital stay. This result is favorably compared with delayed or of treatment. Uh, crit uh, critical uh, appraiser did the uh, critical appraiser did the study addresses clearly for cause issue. Yes, did the authors use an overshared method to answer the question? No, based on based on retrospective control match gathered data, beta if prospective comparative study to verify best result. Where the subject uh, recorded in uh, acceptable ways, yes. Where the measures accurately measured to reduce the bias, small sample size, then did the time of follow up enough to compare results of articular service uh, reduction? No, we recommend more long time for, uh, for, for future to uh, to uh, for our rights and uh, thanks that was a fantastic presentation really nicely done um can i ask you a question in your institution how do you guys typically manage pilon fractures um meaning to say you know in in relationship to this article do you operate on these early or do you usually delay and what would you train your your registrars to do your residents. I'm not understanding you uh, again, please. Your question. How how is it that you treat pilon fractures in your setting? Do you operate early, or do you wait to operate on them? Uh, according to the soft tissue. According to a soft tissue condition, if it's okay, well, maybe be operated within the two, three, five days, yani early. I see. And so you make that decision based on how swollen the patient is or whether, so in the, I'm talking about closed injuries. Yes, yes, or closed injuries. Or yeah. when the sure by or the extent of fixation. Yeah. So I think that that's a key learning point to this is that, um, you know, typically speaking, what we do is an ankle, uh, a pilon fracture that comes in that has a lot of swelling, there's a high risk of wound complication. So it is best to place an external fixation and because, wait. Because this fracture uh, caused by high energy trauma. Precisely, that's exactly right. So waiting for the soft tissue to cool down will reduce the risk of infection in the future. So that I think is a really key point. Now, the thing is this article is making the, the, um, making the suggestion that perhaps that dogma is not entirely correct perhaps operating earlier on these, on these injuries is still safe. They're reporting that they actually don't have such a high complication rate associated with operating early. So uh, I'd like to hear some comments from some of the other faculty um, uh, on what they thought of this paper. Uh, any, anybody from the Libyan side have any comments on this paper? Uh, Hi, ah, yes, I can say something yeah. about this um, um, experience. Uh, I think it's um, clearly this type of fracture is a high energy injury and the majority of them, they have a soft tissue problem. And uh, I know it's individual things, individual patients, but still the key point is to really uh, look at the soft tissue. 
as they say in the pillow fracture, uh, tissue is the issue. Mm -hmm. And the principal uh, majority of this fracture the, can be kept in elevation, ice, and weight, or as we call it, plan, scan, and, and span. Majority of them with uh, the x uh, But yes, I think we had a couple of cases where we operated early uh, with a minimum soft tissue um, uh, damage and also uh, done through PEC um, approach, which gained popularity. So yes, individualized cases, but majority, they, 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 they need to wait for a few days. That's more personal experience. Thank you. That's a, that's a great comment. I mean, I think that the important point here is that it's obviously patient dependent. And it's dependent on like how you know soon the patient arrives, what the me mechanism of injury is, what their soft tissue is, obviously. Uh, but there is some literature out there that shows that even patients who do not have uh, significant swelling on arrival uh, with a pilon fracture, because it is high energy, um, they still have a high rate of complications, wound complications associated with early surgery. And remember, they're operating uh, in this paper. They're operating within 36 hours. So I'm, I'm curious. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, K-Rod, are you there? Uh, any comment on this? Are there any pilons that you would operate on within 36 hours after injury? Yes, I, I, I would comment that in, in the last decade or so, there's been, uh, uh, you, you've been seeing more, page, more papers in the literature um, advocating that under certain conditions, early surgery is acceptable. And I, I think what you need to really assess, obviously, is it soft tissues, the energy delivered, but a little bit also the, the setting and where these these uh, these injuries are happening and and the system that's kind of taking uh, care of them in terms of the resources and the ability to to bring patients to the operating room fairly quickly. We have we have often operated in fractures as you know within an hour or two of arrival, but with, with good results. And we have also had disappointing uh, uh, results because it's really, when you do it really quickly, the, the extent of soft tissue injury hasn't, hasn't become delineated yet. So a, a tissue that appears healthy uh, without blisters and just a little bit swollen and contused might deteriorate very rapidly within the following 24 hours. And if you do your surgery then, you can find yourself in trouble. The most interesting point of this paper, ha having learned in recent years and, and work with some, uh, had some visitors from China. I was so surprised uh, about how few patients this paper, this paper had, because my experience with my Chinese colleagues is that they're just doing incredible volumes of trauma. And uh, I, I think that they probably are ex experiencing a, a lot of the same problems we have in terms of long-term follow-up. To give you an example, one of my uh, friends who visited from Shanghai with one of the AO fellowships came to us, you know, to Harvard to kind of learn what we did. And we ended up learning more from him because, because th th this gentleman uh, was telling me that in his institution in Shanghai, which is the main center for, for trauma, they have 13 trauma teams working at the same time. They have clinics that see a thousand patients in a day. This 46 cases of pilon fractures would be three, four days of, of care for them. So they have an ability to do these studies that's going to, that, 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 that if they were to uh, uh, be, become more involved in the publishing process, they, they have huge contributions to make. And I bet you, if, if, if what I've learned applies to Sichuan, uh, the, the, the surgeons who do this are very injury specific. So the fellow who does the pilon fractures, that may be all he does. So, so the level of expertise that these uh, uh, surgeons in China are, are gaining with a particular type of fracture can be a bit misleading. They can be, you know, th these, are, these are, it's only a 46 patient study, but I bet you these surgeons are doing hundreds and hundreds of just these fractures a year. And, and, and you have to count that, the, the, the amount of judgment and expertise that you gain from that degree of specialization will show in these results and, and, and that ability to select the patient for acute repair versus delayed repair. Thanks, K-Rod. That, that's a great point. Um, actually, I would ask uh, my Libyan colleagues on the call, uh, how frequently do you see pilon fractures um, and who manages them? 
Uh, do you have folks like in China, as, as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned, who are specialists just in lower extremity reconstruction? Or are these cases that uh, the registrars are doing alone? What, what is the situation in Libya? Uh, any, any of the faculty from Libya, please feel free to comment. Okay. I will speak. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation from the Slayton Hospital. Uh, in our hospital in Jalal Benghazi, the protocol was to uh, 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 scan and uh, scan and the plan, not directly to do this uh, complicated fracture, because the soft tissue and the blisters too much very high. And I uh, I have one uh, critic. criticism of this uh, paper and in the late uh, late surgery because we faced one case uh, after we do it in the later he has uh, he has the virus uh, deformity and we do uh, uh, osteotomy close wedge osteotomy and something a big operation was that's why i i i, I mean that uh, If it's early, it's, it will be better because it's maybe virus or vulgar. Uh, speak about uh, the late uh, complication when he do do the operation lately after four week or uh, six week. That's it. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Guila. Um, so, in your setting, do you find that there are a lot of delays in these pylon fracture cases getting to your center, and do you find that? Um, they are receiving external fixators at other institutions before they arrive to your place? Yes, yes. A good line in the external fixator delta frame, we keep it low. I see. And, and Dr. Farouk Algandos, I see your hands. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, hi, Karen. Twice, I was... uh, two or twice. That's why I, I, I uh, a lot of malalignment. In the, uh, when... Oh, I think we lost uh, Dr. Guila. Uh, Dr. Farouk Algandos, please go ahead. Yes, Karen, how are you? Fine, thank uh, you. I would like just to thank everybody for the attending this, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, a highly uh, appreciated uh, meeting. We are discussing uh, a good, uh, actually, subject, which is the pillum fracture is very important, and it is all, uh, almost a high percentage of patients they have a pillum fracture, whether it's the RTA or even the isolation. In our center, actually, we treat these cases uh, in terms of caution. So we try to span, as they say, then scan. And in the meantime, to respect the soft tissue. We haven't any study to, to try to do that early, but all our patients usually, we try just to fix with delta frame, if whatever the type of surgery, unless it's a small, uh, what do you call the uh, fracture, which is, we can, we can go maybe within uh, 36 hours, but in my center, whenever. We always do that in one week time when we do the x fix respect the soft tissue, treat the soft tissue, uh, what you call uh, cautiously, and then we go and we fix the plate, uh, the, the, uh, the fracture, whether we go anterolateral or medial, it all depends on the fracture pattern, but the main is soft tissue because this is a very important. And when you, when you go to fix, you have to, to get the, uh, the uh, what do you call the intra alignment, that's the, the most important, the ankle uh, congruency. Uh, thanks for that. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you, Dr. Farouk, that's a great point. And uh, Dr. Mazen Youssef has just mentioned that due to some facility issue, sometimes uh, he is using uh, just POP, so plaster of Paris, uh, if -fix, instead of the X-fix. Um, so that's very interesting. Uh, now, just for the uh, purposes of time, I'd like to move on. Uh, are the presenters for the ankle fracture paper available to talk about their paper? No? 
What about the ankle fusion paper? Who no, okay, okay, Reggie. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Take permission for uh, share the screen, please. Oh, sure. Aaron, can you give them permission? I think he is Okay, you should be able to Oh, uh, sorry, guys. We're gonna we're gonna keep going with the P law. Sorry, with the. Uh, with with the K the journal club conversation, not the cases yet. Can we can we go back to the journal club? Yeah, we're still we're still doing the journal club, guys. So we we have a we have another presentation. Of like, is is anybody available to talk about the ankle fracture paper? That was uh, Dr. Zayad Al Daibani and Dr. Ahmad Asad. Hello. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. yeah. Hello, uh, doctor. Today, me and Dr. Ahmad would like to talk about non operative treatment of medial nerves in the bimineral and trimineral ankle fraction, a randomized control trial. Hello, hello, doctor. Yes, we can, we can hear you loud and clear. Please go ahead. Today, me and Dr. Ahmad I would like to talk about non-operative treatment of medial mirror and the bimerous and trimeral anchor fracture and randomized control triad. Under that anchor fracture, it represented one most common injury treated by orthopedic surgeon. And overreduction and internal fixation is generalized as recommended for treated of disabilities and undisabled fracture. The stability of the ankle joint relies on the following structure, lateral complex and medial complex. Lateral complex consisting of the lateral mirror and lateral ligament. Medial complex consisting of the medial mirror and deltoid ligament and the anterior or posterior syndromatic ligament. You find the stability as the ability of the ankle to withstand physiological stress without disability. Injury of the ankle maintaining its stability as long as the three visit structure remain intact. The rupture of ligament are occasionally seen and associated with ulcer injury by usually a fracture of a lateral or medial nerve, indicate competence of ligament. The Scotch surgery are both not lying in operative treatment of the angle fracture. Is your audio working? Mm, I think we've lost the audio for some reason. Okay, okay. There, now I can hear you, go ahead. Yes, remove the mute, mute it to the From begin or continue? Okay. Yes, please go ahead. Finish your presentation. Yes. Anchor fracture represents the one of the most common injury treated by the orthopedic surgery and open reduction and uh, internal fixation is generalized or recommended for the treatment of disability and unstable fracture. The severity of the ankle joint released on the following structure, lateral complex consists of the lateral mirrors and lateral ligament. The medial complex consists of the medial mirrors and the toad ligament and the anterior and posterior and the middle ligament. You find the severity as the ability of the ankle to withstand the physiological stress without disability. The injury ankle maintains its stability as long as the three, this structure remains intact. The rupture of ligament cautionary seen in the associated with osseous injury, but usually fracture of lateral or medial mirror indicates the competence of ligament. Scott surgery are both not lame. The bionair, the operative treatment of the angular fracture, he emphasizes perfect anatomical reconstruction to prevent the developmental post-traumatic arthritis. Rain also maintains that the length and the alignment of the fibula 
had to be restored to re-stabilize the con congruence in the Mortis view. This idea was challenged by Muller and until the 1960s. It was commonly believed that media mirrors represent the key element in the achieving the anatomical reduction and joint congruence. Great, during, so two, during two year period, the city patient sustained displacement or unsta unstable by mineral or primary fracture. We are treatment surgical at our clinic along the two the medial soft tissue injury. Retrospective survey revealed this uh, that 30 of this 15 patients presented the functional result comparable to the patient treated with overreduction of the both mayoral. We also observed that the medial mayoral tended to, re to relation after the overreduction and terminal fixation of another component. Based on this finding, we hypothesize it whether necessary to treat the non displaced medial mineral fracture with internal fixation and after adequate overreduction and terminal fixation of lateral component. And now with, with Dr. Ahmed, with patient and me. Yes. Great, thank you very much, that was great. So please, uh, just uh, for the purposes of time, give me the, the key points uh, in the discussion that you would like to discuss. Yes, yes. Dr. Ahmed? Dr. Ahmed? Hello. Hello. Hi, Dr. Ahmed, we can hear you. I'm fine. Uh, yeah, uh, would you like uh, me to talk more uh, a little about the approach or something like that? Well, I think, uh, well, tell me a little bit about um, what what you think the key takeaway, the key message of this paper is, um, yeah, and yeah. do you think that it uh, like how does it affect your clinical practice? Uh, how do you manage the medial malleolus in your trimal and bimalleolar ankle fractures? Yeah, um, uh, in this paper, uh, they they try to discuss the uh, fixation of uh, of uh, if you have if, if, if we have a case of trimalleolar fracture, for example, uh, then. Uh, they started with fixation of the lateral malleolus first, of course, and they found uh, that uh, if, uh, if the medial malleolus uh, not fixed in some cases, uh, that could not cause any problem in the future. Uh, for example, it, it will not cause uh, osteoarthritis or functional outcome, or functional disability, I mean. So, um, but this, uh, in this study, I think uh, the weak point here is uh, uh, follow up time for for post post operative or post traumatic osteoarthritis is not as long as as required because uh, development of osteoarthritis may take many long time it may take uh, more than 10 years to develop but um, in this study i think uh, the time was a little bit short um, another i have uh, another point uh, regarding the consideration of smoking and the risk factors of non-union uh, was not uh, considered in this, uh, in this study. Uh, I think this, uh, these are the main points uh, in, uh, I want to clarify. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Those are very important points, actually. You know, any time that we think about an articular reduction, the reason that we're trying to get such a perfect reduction is because we're trying to obviously get perfect healing and prevent arthritis in the future. And you bring up such an important yeah. point that the follow-up perhaps isn't long enough to see if this matters. Um, but I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Daniel Gus from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital to, uh, to make a comment here. You know, he was the one who gave the lecture on ankle fractures. He's an expert in these types of surgeries. Uh, Dr. Gus, do you have any comment on this article? Are there any cases where you are not fixing the medial malleolus? And uh, you know, what do you think of the, the message that this paper is trying to make? Um, it's, it's funny. I'm glad we picked this paper, um, because it teaches us how to analyze papers, right? You have a randomized study, they draw a conclusion. And yet I find myself, you know, actually struggling to incorporate this paper into my practice in a way that they kind of desired. And so first and foremost, realize that you're talking about a very specific subset of papers, of patients. These are patients in which when you reduce and fix the, the lateral malleolus, the outside of the ankle, the medial malleolus is less than two millimeters displaced. 
I realize that if, if the medial malleolus is not reduced, this paper does not apply. Secondly, the issue I have with it is you, you can look at the same data and draw very different conclusions. Here, one in 10 didn't heal. Um, and so you, it's, it's, you have someone in the operating room and yet you're making a decision not to, to, to fix something while you're there, knowing that there's a one in 10 chance that that won't heal. Uh, second, they're using non-validated outcome scores. And so these scores may, may not apply, right? It's, uh, th they're hard to interpret for every patient. And lastly, when you look at the subtypes of fractures, right, 44, they, they talked about AO44, that, that just refers to an ankle malleolar fracture. They're not talking about the orientation of the medial malleolar fracture. So even when we're talking about medial malleolar fractures, they are not all the same. The, the what we call the more avulsive ones, the ones in which the fracture line is flat is very different than one in which the fracture line is more vertical and it's more of a shear type injury. The more you get into a shear type injury, the more I would worry about non-union. And so where I use this paper, interestingly enough, clinically, is less anything to do with uh, the, the specific aim of this paper. My decision not to fix the medial malleolus if I am already in the operating room and it was displaced to begin with is more based on soft tissue. So it gives me a little bit of reassurance where if the soft tissue, right, because when you have an open ankle fracture or when the skin is tenuous, that is usually on the anterior medial side where the skin is thin and adherent. And so it gives me a little bit of confidence to know that, that you know, the risk benefit analysis may be to leave the medial malleolus alone or to do something, what I more often do, something percutaneous, like use a K wire uh, instead of a screw. The more common time I use this paper, and there's another paper that, that, um, that was a randomized that looked at this, is, is, the, is what do you do with the rare isolated medial malleolar fracture. Someone comes in with an isolated medial malleolar fracture, and then you're trying to make a decision about the operating room or not, especially when it's vertical shear. And so that's where I find it helpful to be able to quote, you know, there's at least a 10% chance of this not healing. As it becomes more of a vertical shear, so the vertical fracture line, I have, I've seen those uh, displaced and, and go on to non-union. So there, I think your threshold has to be even lower to, fi to fix them. You, ha you, you want, the, the more the fracture is a vertical shear, the more you want to fix it. And so I, I personally still lean strongly towards fixing the medial malleolus. I think it is very hard to make an assessment of how displaced something is based on fluoroscopy alone without CT scan. You can get fooled in the operating room based on your angle. And on the flip side, this gives me a little bit more confidence if the soft tissues don't allow me to fix the medial malleolus, et cetera. Thank you, Dr. Gus. Those are really uh, very, very good points for this. I mean, I, for me, when, when you're in the operating room already, to not go and fix the medial malleolus doesn't really make sense unless there's a reason not to, as you mentioned, the soft tissue. So I think that that's a really good takeaway from all of this. Uh, you know, if, uh, if you're there already, why not fix it, especially in these more vertical shear patterns, patterns that are sort of more prone to, uh, to non-union or displacement. Um, Dr. Zayad, um, would you like to make any point here about how you take care of these injuries? Um, yes. Uh, I'm sure you see many of them in your practice. Yes, Dr. Kiran, uh, thank you for Dr. Uh, Ahmed Saad and Dr. Diaz Debani uh, regarding this uh, uh, journal club articles. But we uh, uh, add comments, uh, as Dr. Daniel say, uh, regarding non operative management or treatment in ankle fractures. As you know, the second most common fracture of the, after the hip fracture is the ankle joint fracture. And in obese and twisting injuries, the most common uh, injury. Uh, maybe I think regarding to classification of the ankle fractures, we will be ankle fracture, we will be especially stage two. This debate uh, case in literature 
until now. Uh, comparative study between cast conservative, non operative, and uh, operative treatment of weaver B ankle fracture until now is still a debate. Uh, we will be ankle fractures uh, at the level of the syndesmosis without rupture of the syndesmosis. This in, in, in depend on the inclusion criteria like the age, good bone stock, uh, no common notion. I think that like this fractures. Uh, go for a uh, conservative treatment uh, with no need for an, any intervention. No dis minimal displacement like uh, this. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, well, in the interest of time, we're actually running a little behind schedule. Um, I'd like to move on to, uh, to the next paper on ankle fusion. Um, let's see, the faculty that I had listed for that one, uh, Dr. Zak uh, Zakaria, El Faitori and Mr. Salim Langhi. Um, this is the clinical outcomes comparing arthroscopic versus open ankle arthrodesis. Um, just if, if for the interest of time, can we keep the presentation very short, just two to, two to five minutes? Are any of those folks available to talk about that article? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, sorry to be late. I was in the surgery. I was back in surgery. No problem and, at all. Uh, Thank you for joining. I, yeah, um, it's nice to meet you all of you. You know, it's, it's a great opportunity of, to communicate with each other, you know, like from uh, two different continents altogether, you know. So, um, so there's um, Dr. Zakaria, I'm afraid he got sick today and he's, uh, he's having his, I think, a surgery kind of surgery now. Um, he's supposed to be joining us, but he said he's, uh, he's got sick. Uh, I just want to get through to the papers. Sorry. No problem. Um, well, we wish him all the best. I'm sorry to hear about that. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to hold you back, but uh, just I'm looking for the article. Okay, one second. I went through the, the article a couple of times. Okay. I no, might no. be presenting it and criticizing it at the same time. You know? Yeah, please. Just, you know, give us, give us your key points, you know. No need to go uh, with the... Well, well, the, the keynote is uh, this paper is from Singapore, and they actually um, uh, they have kind of uh, comparing uh, uh, the clinical outcomes, comparing arthroscopic versus uh, open ankle arthrodesis. Um, um, I never heard. Of, well, the names are not uh, quite familiar to me, uh, but for an ankle surgery, but uh, they were they were talking about yeah, that's much better actually. Uh, they were they talk about uh, taking a couple of patients. Control study was the open ankle arthrodesis, and the study uh, group were the arthroscopic. They took about over 10, 15 years uh, period, like um, uh, as a retrospective to start with study. And uh, they took uh, they look at uh, by single surgeon done the arthroscopic open arthroscopic study, and the other one was done uh, by uh, a couple of trained or uh, what you call foot and ankle surgery fellowship trainers. And uh, they, they compare the, the both, the, uh, both, uh, uh, both papers. And they, uh, that's the introduction, the aim to compare and do uh, when they were thinking of uh, the favor of open arthroscopic, uh, uh, so, sorry, arthroscopic arthrodesis instead of open thesis so that's what they did and this is the the whole papers about the material and they said they went retrospectively they checked the, the they checked the results they checked the, the the way they did the surgeries and they was just checking uh, they they used the pmi the asia gender as their uh, comparative study for uh, to co to compare the outcomes of both ways uh, the methods that they say they say from 2004 to 2015, and uh, they use a couple of scores like American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Societies, the, the Ankle for uh, Hind Foot scores, and uh, SF36 scores. It's all mostly subjective scores, uh, courses, um, uh, scores. And the result they came out that the uh, um, arthroscopic arthrodesis was outweighed, or the advantage of having arthroscopic arthrodesis outweighed uh, uh, the open ones. 
Uh, they use uh, a lot of tests, uh, like uh, Pearson tests for uh, a statistical uh, analysis for uh, for the paper. They use uh, Pearson the T test. They use uh, um, the paired ones. Sorry, I'll just check what else. Well, don't don't uh, don't worry, um, Mr. Lunghi. I think that that's that's a, a great summary. Uh, just my question to you is: they, they use the power studies. The power analysis and the yeah. My uh, sorry, I think there's a bit of a delay here. My my question to you is, you know, um, I'm here. How uh, how available is ankle arthroscopy in your practice or in Libya in general? Um, and does this paper convince you that it's a technology that's worth having in your patients who have uh, a need for an arthrodesis? Um, uh, how do you feel about that? No, oh, I think we lost, uh, we lost Dr. Langi. Um, Dr. Uh, Wariaz, are you on the line? Yes. Hi, thanks so much for joining. Um, so I just wanted to see if maybe you had any commentary on this. Uh, when you're performing your ankle arthrodesis at MGH, um, do you typically do it arthroscopically or open? Does it depend on which circumstances are you choosing one method or the other? And what's your feeling for making that decision? That's a, that, that's a very good uh, topic to sort of discuss sort of the, the way that I your, break your it down. Your question that is it available in Libya or not, isn't it? Oh. Sorry, I think we're crossing wires here. Uh, yes, you can answer that question. Is it available in Libya? Yeah, well, not the, 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 the small, I use the knee arthroscopy, to be honest with you, to do the ankle arthroscopy, because it's not available, but we, I use the same, uh, same shaver, same camera for the knee, I use it for, uh, uh, for the ankle. And other things, we don't have that traction for the, for the ankle. So I use the marriage child to assist me to distract, uh, distract the, the joint. So we work what we available with us here. It's not that uh, we can provide this, but once we, we build up the kind of foundation for this, but I do them usually with using a knee arthroscopy. Gotcha. Amir, on the same thing. Thank you for that, Dr. Langi. And and Dr. Warriors, go ahead. Sorry, I think we interrupted what you were about to say. A, a, a lot of surgeons in the U.S. actually will use a, a knee arthroscopy setup as well in terms of the scope size. The shavers themselves are actually a little bit easier to remove large amounts of cartilage from. Um, my breakdown for whether it's arthroscopic or open depends first on how bad the deformity is. So sometimes if you have to, to remove you know, parts of the plafond, uh, to get the alignment anatomic, or you have to do lots of soft tissue releases, then it's really not going to do as well arthroscopically. The other issue comes in if the patient's post-traumatic is whether or not they've had um, hardware in place. And so if they have a hardware that's bothering them on the fibula and you have to open up to take that out anyways, then I'll do a fibula onlay technique, which is open. Um, the other day I did one where a woman had a, a large medial malleolar exostosis, but we prepped the joint arthroscopic and then removed that open so that we can make smaller incisions over the hardware. The, the only concern that I have with arthroscopic is uh, with an intact fibula, how much compression are you actually getting at the joint? I haven't really seen an elevated non-union rate in my practice, but it's always a concern is how well are you compressing across the joint? And, uh, but the arthroscopic, I think you actually can see a little bit further into the back of the ankle and get that sort of posterior half of the talus better prepped uh, with joint prep. So um, I would say I'm about 50 50 on my practice 50% are open and 50% are arthroscopic. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Dr. Ali, uh, you have your hand up. Did you have a comment that you wanted to make? Can you unmute, unmute your microphone, please? We can't hear you, Dr. Ali. Now? Yes, can now. You yes, now. now okay. uh, first of all, thank you for all participants in this uh, lecture, in this very interesting lecture. 
uh, I'm, I'm afraid that we don't have it in Libya, Ankel Arthroscope. Uh, as Dr. Langi said, most of us, they're using, if there is possible, use uh, knee arthroscope. Uh, we don't uh, use ankle arthroscope regularly. And uh, you, just, you can consider it as a comment or, or a question for, uh, it's, it's, I know it's a little bit delayed or a little bit late. Uh, does we need to open all ankle fracture what is whatever type A, Weber A or B or C? Uh, I have a, according to my knowledge or my information, all ankle fracture needs a fixation. We don't use. I can, there is no any any rule for conservative treatment in ankle fracture. So regular the new regular using now just now all ankle fracture needs a fixation, whatever type A or type B or type C. And I would like to to. Uh, to know from you or your your uh, experience in this field, does the conservative management of ankle fracture has any role just now, or you open all the ankle fracture? And I do thank you again for this uh, uh, this nice, interesting uh, lecture. And I, I am on the way. I will I will try to make another question as I can as I as I can anyway. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, before we jump into answering your question on ankle fracture, I did just want to pause and see if any of the remaining faculty had any more comments about ankle arthroscopy and ankle, especially in the setting of ankle fusion related to this paper before we stop discussing it. Any other comments that anybody wanted to make on this paper? I would just add that from the technical point of view, uh, to, you know, given the resources you have for a lot of ankle arthroscopy, we do use the ankle arthroscope, you know, for things like osteochondral defects, et cetera. And so that can understandably be more challenging with a knee arthroscope, which is bigger. On the flip side, when it comes to this specific paper, the good news is, is both Greg and I and, and, and Lorraine, I can speak for, is we use actually on purpose a knee arthroscope you're generating a lot of debris when you're performing in arthroscopic fusion. And so the knee scope and the knee sized instruments, the bigger, you know, five and a half millimeter burr, et cetera, is much better at clearing that. And so, uh, and it's actually easier to see. And so um, thankfully the Libyan and the Boston equipment are very similar when it comes to ankle fusion. Dr. Lorena, did you have another point to make about ankle arthroscopy and fusion? I you know the first one that I was going to make is um, what Daniel was mentioning that uh, for ankle fusion specifically, um, as he said, we we prefer to use the the knee scope, which is the four o millimeter scope. Um, as uh, Daniel was saying, offers like probably perform the surgery more efficiently. And um, and I think it's totally fine. Um, so um, uh, I'm right now in France uh, doing a traveling fellowship, and a lot of people here, a lot of surgeons here, actually use the four O millimeter scope for other procedures as well. They don't they don't use the two point seven. Um, so just kind of encourage our colleagues in Libya that um, in Europe they use it as well. And um, so now a lot of the times they don't use distraction. Uh, they uh, support, they use, I do, I use distraction um, and I will continue to use distraction, but it's just a different way to do things. They don't use distraction here for a lot of the procedures and are they able to do it uh, just using the new scope. It's kind of like encourage uh, all of you continue to use it because a lot of people does it and, and it works. Great, thank you. That's a great point. Um, so back to Dr. Ali's question that he asked about ankle fracture treatment, um, you know, trying to figure out which ankle fracture should be treated operatively or non-operatively. I think Dr. Ali's point was that because it's an, art, it's an uh, articular fracture, uh, you must operate on all ankle fractures. And I certainly, in my experience, in my training, um, I, uh, I did not learn that method. There are certainly ankle fractures that we at Harvard will routinely treat non-operatively. Um, so uh, rather than discuss it myself, I'd like to maybe ask uh, Dr. Gus and Dr. Rodriguez to comment on, uh, on, this, on this question. Um, Dr. Gus, would you like to start first? 
And so I think in every field of orthopedics, what I've learned is to be careful about absolutes. I find that I'd, I'd like to say the more gray hair I get, but but I don't think that's true. The, uh, <laughs> the older I get, the more I, I, I find that there's gray zones. And so I find that I'm rarely using the word always, um, except when I'm saying I will always love my wife. Um, and so the reality for it is, I think the most important reason to fix an ankle fracture is if the tibio tailor relationship is disrupted because of the ankle fracture. We don't fix ankle fractures. We fix ankle instability. And so if the fracture has rendered the ankle unstable, then I completely agree. If the ankle has not been rendered unstable by the fracture, then, then I, I think the thresh of the reason you have to have a, a, another reason to fix it. And, and I'm not saying those don't exist, right? There's a lot of gray zone about how much displacement of the lateral mal can you tolerate if the medial clear space is symmetric. Um, you, you know, certainly a little bit of an articular irregularity, even if the mortise is reduced can draw, you know, I've, I've treated those, but but on the whole, I, I think we should separate injury from instability. We fix ankle fractures because the ankle has been rendered unstable. Dr. Rodriguez, any comment on that? I think Dan put it pretty, pretty well. No. Yeah, that was well put after that. <laughs> uh, the other question I have here from Dr. Moe Zeton is uh, slightly related to this topic. In an unstable ankle fracture with a displaced mortise, but no medial malleolus fracture, would you repair the deltoid ligament when you fix the fibula? So this is, I think, a fairly, uh, um, you know, there's some maybe difference of opinion between our trauma colleagues like Dr. Rodriguez and our foot and ankle colleagues. Um, so uh, maybe I would ask uh, Dr. Lorena, would you like to comment on this? Do you fix the deltoid routinely? And, and Dr. Chen, if you're on the line too, to maybe comment on this question. Uh, routinely as... I would say always, no, I don't. Uh, so uh, we always start with the fibula, you, you fix the fibula, you assess the instability of the syndesmosis, and then uh, let's say you fix the syndesmosis, and uh, if you check how reduced <laughs> is the ankle joint. And um, it, this is uh, an idea because I actually did a biomechanical study on this where we proved that uh, if you fix the syndesmosis and the joint proved to be reduced, if it is in an acute setting, uh, you don't need to fix the deltoid because it, it provides instabi the stability that you need. But if despite you fix the syndesmosis and you're still seeing a, an opening gap, then I will, or if uh, there is some, um, if you think there is like a, a, a small piece of bone that it will, uh, in, in, it will limit the healing of the deltoid, uh, then it will be an indication for it. But if there is no indication of this and uh, the joint is completely reduced after you uh, fix the fibula and the syndesmosis in case there is uh, an injury of the syndesmosis, uh, I, I won't. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lorena. That was a great. Uh, that was that was great. So, how, how do you fix your how do you fix your deltoid? What do you use to do it? If it is in an acute setting, uh, you can uh, just it depends if the if the tissue is in is adequate. You can uh, just repair it to the bone. You can do it through using trans osseous um, sutures, or uh, some people use uh, suture anchor. So it will be totally up to you. And is, I don't know if uh, Dr. Moise Zayton can maybe comment in Libya, um, if you guys are fixing the deltoid, how do you fix it? What instruments, what, what tools are available to you? Are you just doing transosseous sutures or do you have suture anchors? What are you using? So I'm actually based in the UK. I'm not based in Libya uh, at the moment. So um, it's it's a controversial topic. Um, it's one that I haven't really formulated a strong opinion on. Um, as you mentioned, uh, my foot and ankle colleagues um, have now begun uh, fixing the deltoid ligaments a lot more regularly. Um, it's not something that I've done before, um, but I think in those cases where um, you fix the fibula and the syndesmosis, as Dr. Lorena said, 
um, if there is incongruity on the medial side or there's a, a anterior collicular fracture, um, or if you think the deltoid ligament is you know, within the joint, then I think those are all good indications to fix it. Um, so yeah, and, and the, the method they're using to fix and get, they're using um, anchors, um, suture anchors. Yeah, well, thanks for that, uh, Moise, that's great. Um, any of our Libyan faculty, is this something that you do routinely, is fixing the deltoid? No, no we don't have, a, we don't fix the deltoid. Okay, yeah, that was probably. Just, that, yes, don't fix it. But okay. if, if uh, we do a stress test and was positive, we put the patient in the cast. Gotcha. After fixation. Yeah, and I think that that's the totally acceptable. Is open. open, open injury. But no, 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 no fixation. Yeah. Open injury. Yeah. Sorry, we have a lot of four injuries. Sometimes it is complete cut. You can see that they talk completely. That's the only time that we're actually fixing it, you know. But there's a closed fracture. We don't usually do that unless it is on like, you know, as a cold case or... Uh, but uh, if it is uh, open wound, which is we seen a lot so many over the last uh, 10 years, and we could repair it uh, like acutely in the same setting, you know, this is the only thing. But, and uh, uh, usually old close fractures, close fractures well, and we don't use, well, anchors is a little bit of- Yes, if it's we open, use we try to repair, but, uh, it's we don't touch. Arthrex, but, uh, but close ones, we don't, yeah, do anything about it. Thanks. Dr. Ali, did you have a comment? Yes, sir. Uh, as uh, my colleague uh, mentioned, in Libya, we don't usually fix a deltoid ligament injury. Unless, as uh, Dr. Salem say, there is a complete rupture of deltoid ligament. But I would like to take this a chance and ask, ask use your, your own experience and uh, uh, the other doctor's uh, experience. If you have one patient 20 years old and has isolated syndesmosis rupture, that means patient has not any fracture of median malleolus or lateral malleolus, just only syndesmosis rupture. Will it treat it conservative or drive it surgically? Thank you again. I'll uh, pose that question to uh, Dr. Bonnie Chan and, and Dr. Lorena, if you would like to make a comment on that one. Well, I'll start. Well, um, so yes, I will fix it. Um, but uh, you, what, what you have to assess there, um, when you said an injury of the syndesmosis, you have to, uh, we're talking about instability of the syndesmosis. How do we diagnose that injury? If it is uh, um, based on a clinical test that uh, the patient is showing that has not only an injury, but also an instability of the syndesmosis, yes, I will fix it. So uh, I think the main point here is to um, find if the patient has just an injury, which is like maybe uh, a, like a partial injury of one of the ligaments, or if it is actually an instability. If you uh, suspect that the patient has instability of the syndesmosis, um, I will fix it. Can you talk about how to make that differentiation, like from your clinical exam or from your imaging? How would you decide that? So the first thing is at uh, the clinical exam, uh, says um, if there is pain around the syndesmosis, there are several tests uh, that has been described. There is not only one test that is um, it's like is the gold standard. Uh, it is more gathering more than one test. It's the hop test, the external rotation test. So if um, so, not, if it is like the group of all these tests that are positive, that you have, um, of course, if you see widening the X-ray that definitely will be a sign of instability plus a clinical exam um, that show you that the patient has an instability of the syndesmosis and in that case, the patient needed treatment. Then with other tests, uh, we have the MRI, which can be, um, uh, can be signs of injury more than instability because we don't have the weight bearing uh, there. So it's not like a true dynamic uh, test. And then there is more advanced like um, weight bearing CT, but if let's say we have a patient with clinical, uh, when a clinical exam that shows uh, that is probably likely, or you're suspecting to have a, 
uh, instead a little of the syndesmosis, but the x-rays um, doesn't show much. Maybe the next step will be um, whether um, trying to do a diagnostic arthroscopy, if we don't have a web variant CD that can provide us information or at ultrasound. The problem with ultrasound is that will depend more of the operator, but that's another tool that uh, has been proved that under the um, uh, radiologist that is very experienced in, uh, in synthesmosis can give you uh, a, like a, a good diagnostic test uh, if it is injury, uh, injury or instability or not. Uh, if all that is still inconclusive, the next step will be a diagnostic arthroscopy. And um, based on that, um, I, I will take the decision if I want to fix the syndesmosis if I think it's unstable. I think the key point that I'm taking away from your commentary, Dr. Lorena, is that um, it's worthwhile to be aggressive, uh, and, and like whether it's with your diagnosis or with your treatment of these injuries. Because a syndesmotic injury is not something that typically will do well non-operatively. If it's a real syndesmotic injury, it merits fixation. Is that fair? Yes, that's fair. If I have to um, to err in the side of uh, fixing it or not fixing it, I think I will give the chance to the patient if I think of there is a subtle instability to fix the syndesmosis. Thank you. That's great. Um, all right, well, so uh, for the purposes of keeping things moving, unfortunately, we had another Journal Club article left. It is related to uh, ankle, uh, so subtalar and um, uh, uh, arthroscopy, and I don't think that that's necessarily, uh, we don't have time to go over it this time, unfortunately. So let, let's move on to the case presentations. Um, this is the uh, tentative order that I had in mind. We would start off with Dr. Lorena's uh, presentation on an ankle fusion case. Uh, and then we have two other ankle fusion cases from uh, Dr. El Khatef and uh, Dr. Sanad Yunus uh, from Libya. And then we'll go into pilon territory. Lots of presentations for that. Dr. Kayrod will give his presentation on a pilon from Harvard. And then we have presentations from Dr. Zayad, uh, Dr. Guila, and uh, Mr. Salem Langi. Uh, very interesting case uh, cases to present. Um, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Beherano Pineda, uh, Lorena, if you wouldn't mind, would you like to give your presentation? Sure. Uh, try to make it really quick. Uh, okay. Let me share my screen here. Okay. So, um, this is a case, uh, like, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit of the story of this patient. Um, this is a 35 year old female. Um, she uh, was an equestrian rider and as she came to the hospital, uh, we didn't see the patient at this initial injury uh, when uh, she had a close ankle dislocation after falling off a horse. This was in November, 2018. She was treated at this point uh, by another provider. Um, she got immediately in the hospital, a close reduction um, and immobilization. And the next day, uh, she underwent to uh, open reduction, internal fixation of the tibial pillow fracture and the fibula. Uh, according to the operative report, um, uh, despite the fixation of the fractures, the uh, ankle joint continued to be unstable, and they decided to um, augment the, the fixation using ex an external fixator that she had for uh, eight weeks. Then she underwent uh, to external fixation removal and continued follow up with that provider at that time. Um, then she came to our clinic a year later, complaining of pain. The pain was me, uh, mainly over the anteromedial aspect of the ankle joint. And these are her x-rays at the time. Uh, physical exam pain level was about four. Um, so as we can see in the previous x-rays, the hind foot alignment was inverse. The incisions were completely healed. Um, just, um, and I would like to keep in mind that this injury was uh, completely closed mm -hmm. and she never had any issues with the skin or uh, wound healing. Uh, she got tender to palpation over the anterior aspect of the joint. The ankle duration motion was a total of 40 degrees, but uh, with a significant lack of dorsiflexion. Strength was five out of five in all planes and um, she was neurovascular intact. 
medical history. She was a former smoker and um, no other uh, past surgical history besides uh, what it entails in this ankle injury. So the diagnosis at that time for this patient was a, a chronic symptomatic right anteromedial ankle pain uh, with underlying post-traumatic arthrosis in the city of Veros Teller till um, and uh, after a closed pilum fracture that uh, happened about a year ago. Then um, I would like, yeah, I kind of like when I, I did this case, uh, I would like a, a little bit of input of uh, the attendants here about uh, what we think about the plan. What are the options for this patient? Um, if this will be your patient, it comes to you after one year of the initial injury, how she presented right now, what will be uh, your plan? What do you think are the options for her? Lorena, can you go back to the x-ray slide? And Aaron, can you put the, uh, the poll up? We'll just give everybody a few minutes here. I think I will go to Arthur. What was that, Dr. Ahmad? Uh, I, I will go to Arthur Dixon. Thank you, Arthur Dixon. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, uh, let's end the poll and let's see what everybody thought. Can you guys see the results here? Seems like uh, it's almost a split between people who thought it should be uh, scoped and debrided and those who thought it should be uh, um, uh, fused. So great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Lorena, take it away. What did you end up doing? Okay, so uh, we were on the same page. We talked with the patient about it and about the, our options for her was uh, doing an ankle arthroscopy and debridement and the ankle arthrodesis. We discussed this with the patient and given that she was very young um, and the pain level at that time it was between four and five, she uh, we agreed to go um, to do an ankle arthroscopy and debridement to see what was the stage of the joint at that time, um, given um, all the injury and the long time uh, that uh, she has been with this. So unfortunately, um, the pictures talk by themselves. Uh, the uh, state of the uh, joint was really bad. She had uh, completely aware of the cartilage in the middle side, and she only had about a third of the lateral aspect of the joint intact. Other than that, we can see even the cartilage in the tibial um, side um, looks really bad. So um, after this surgery, uh, the pain didn't actually get better. Um, so she came to us a few months after these are uh, the x-rays at that time. And um, we discussed this with her and we decided to proceed with an ankle fusion and removal of hardware. So these are the images, uh, the operative images um, of her procedure. We decided to do an arthroscopic ankle fusion. Um, I'll just go back. We, uh, we did a small incision to like a, very small incisions to remove the plate that it was immediately and the K wires. And we just uh, proceed to do our standard um, ankle fusion arthroscopically uh, through two portals anteriorly and um, fuse it with um, kind of latest screws as we can see here. So um, just a few x-rays of the follow up the patient. This is about five, almost six weeks um, after the fusion. Uh, she's doing well at that time she was wearing a cast and um, like the last uh, follow up uh, of this patient is this, almost 12 uh, weeks after the surgery. She has no pain and she start, uh, She has been doing physical therapy and a start partial wet bearing at this time in a tall um, air cast boot. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. 
Thanks, Dr. Lorena. Um, one question I have for you based on this x-ray, it looks like you didn't incorporate the fibula into your fusion. Um, can you comment a little bit on that? Like whether that's uh, necessary or that that's, I mean, obviously it's not necessary to do so. You didn't do it in this case and the patient had a great fusion. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, um, so it's not necessary in all the cases. Um, sometimes you can do it. Uh, it depends on the deformity that uh, you feel like uh, the patient is in, in, a, in a complete deformity that is in a complete virus that you need some instability for that uh, fusion, you can use it. But in that case, uh, if you're gonna do that also, you can use it as a bone graft. And for those cases, will be for an open uh, or an open fusion. And when if the patient has severe deformity, so when we do the arthroscopic uh, ankle fusions, we don't incorporate at least I don't incorporate the fibula in my fixation. Great, thank you. That's great. Great case. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Bonnie Chen, uh, assistant professor from. Uh... Oh. There we are, sorry, I lost the screen. Uh, assistant professor from uh, Columbia University. Um, uh, Dr. Chen, would you like to make any comment on this case? Um, hello, everybody. It's good to see everybody, familiar faces, and um, for the honor to be part of this conference. Um, so I wanted to make a point just for some of maybe the younger registrars or people who are in training or just overall kind of lifelong learning process um, from these conferences. So I think these are some very humbling cases when even when you're doing the initial ankle fracture fixation, particularly in this one, which I think the medial malleolus probably was more of a vertical shear type. Um, and these can always be challenging in terms of the fixation and the potential risk for arthritis. So I just wanted to pose sort of the thought um, to everybody in terms of why they think um, this, you know, sometimes you're just unlucky, but sometimes I think it's really important to critically assess the x-rays to see if there's any, um, contribution of the initial fixation, um, the, the union, the sort of malunion that it later developed slightly varus, um, that may have contributed to, um, this person having post-traumatic arthritis. So I think that's one comment that I'd make that I, um, we don't necessarily have to answer it now, but I think just to think out loud a little bit. Um, and then I think the second question for, or more of a comment, and this is again, just to point out on a, on a technical tip for this excellent sort of fixation construct of three screws. Like one thing I think for the registrars to take note, if you look at one of the posterior screws that were placed um, in absolutely the correct position, like against the back of the tibia, um, when you're putting that screw, and if you're coming laterally, I think one important thing tip to take note of is that you make sure that you're actually down in the tibia and you're not on the fibula because sometimes um, it's easy to feel that you're on bone, but you're actually on the fibula and not really against the tibia when you put in that screw. So just one thing again to take note of, I want to make sure everybody feels that, you know, um, there's some technical tips um, that we also put into these excellent presentation of cases today. Thanks, Dr. Chen. Um, so, uh... Are there any comments from the Libyan side about how, like if this patient had presented in your setting, um, would you have done an ankle scope? Would you have just gone straight to the fusion? How do you like to do your fusions? Do you do a plate? Do you like three screws as Dr. Lorena has demonstrated here? Any comments from the Libyan side? Yes, Dr. Ali, please. Oh, go ahead and unmute. We can't hear you. Yes, go yes, ahead. No? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, my choice from the beginning, it's ankle arthrodesis. And uh, as I have mentioned before, we don't have uh, ankle arthroscope available in Libya. And uh, the, the case which already presented by Dr. Irina, uh, the best choice is the uh, ankle arthrodesis. And we do almost the same by the same way. Three cannulated screw is enough for her. But I don't know the fixation of the fibula, Dr. Irina, just mentioned that comment, but I unfortunately I don't hear what did it mention. Why did uh, did she fix the fibula? I think three cannulitis group for ankle arthrodesis is enough. Uh, that's what we do we can do here in Libya. Uh, and I mean at least the hospital where I am working. So thank Doctor, yeah, thank you, Dr. Ali. So to clarify, um, I, I asked Dr. Lorena if it was necessary to incorporate the fibula, and her response was no, it's not. 
the fibula had already been fixed and she left it alone. And I think as you and I and Lorena all agree, the fixation was fantastic and it was a really good fantastic. fusion. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank Very you. nice. Okay, well, so let's move on to the next case presentation, if that's all right. Um, Dr. Mustafa al uh would you like to present? Yes, uh, present. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Good day for all. Today, uh, we have three cases. Uh, one case for discussion and uh, two cases. I am uh, working, uh, uh, still working for, uh, for, uh, for him. Uh, I will start uh, with, the, with the discussion case. Yeah, let's uh, let's allow you to share. Just one minute. I prepare my share. There is a problem. Maybe uh, ad ad admin must be uh, let me to uh, to do sharing. You should be able to share your screen now. Gotcha. Here. Are you able to share your screen? I can't able. Okay, share. well, I, I'm able to share the screen maybe for you, if that's okay. Um, I believe this is this is your presentation. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I can just tell me how to advance your slides. I'm happy to share my screen. I, I, I don't send to you a discussion case. I will start with the two cases which which I working to it. Oh, I see. Okay, all right. Well, Aaron, can we try to see how doctor uh, doctors can share their screen? Are you on? You can't listen to me. Can you try to share your screen now? It is a PowerPoint, not PDF. Yeah, go ahead and try to try try to share your screen now. BBT cannot share. Aaron, just let all participants share their screen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 How's it going, guys? Are we there? Can you try again? Uh, doctor, you can, you can let uh, another person uh, to start his uh, presentation and then uh, to, to do solution of my uh, problem. All right, that's fine. So, Dr. Sanan okay. Yunus, would you like to present yours? Yes. Yes. Hello, everyone. Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi. I'm fine. Fine. Thanks. Thanks you. Uh, Dr. Kiran, could you please uh, share slide for me? Yes. No problem. For my case. No problem at all. Let me pull it up right now. It was BBS. Here you are. Oh, okay. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sanad Yunus. Uh, I will present a case of uh, post-traumatic uh, osteoarthritis with ankle joint. Uh, this case presented to me uh, two years after initial trauma. I haven't seen uh, him uh, at first, and uh, uh, he presented to me after doing multiple operations. We have a 55 years old uh, patient. He's a smoker. 
with history of uh, open ankle fracture. Uh, actually, I don't have the x-rays at the initial time of injury. Operated at first with the spanning external fixator, then he underwent a second operation for open reduction and internal fixation. But unfortunately, he got infected and underwent another operation for uh, removal of the uh, implant and uh, bone cement were applied at the ankle joint. The patient presented to my clinic uh, complaining of uh, pain, painful range of movement and uh, inability to bear weight on the affected extremity with multiple discharging sinus, sinuses uh, in front of the ankle joint. Uh, on examination, I found the patient have uh, discharging sinus on, on the anterior motor function with palpable peripheral pulse and good capillary, capillary refilling. Laboratory investigation, the patient has high, high ESR level and high CRB title. And he presented to me with this X-ray in front view. As you can see, there is a, a bone osteopenia. There is a, a non-united fracture in the distal fibula. And uh, there is an ankle osteoarthritis and there's a cement impacted in the anterolateral aspect of the ankle joint. And uh, so here we have two problems to, to solve. The first is infection, and the second thing is the osteoarthritis of the ankle joint. So I would like to pause for a minute to hear from uh, the senior faculty uh, their opinion about this case. What, what would you like to do in this case? So I'll pose that question to Dr. Bonnie Chen and also Dr. Uh, Ken Rodriguez. Uh, what would you do in this situation? I'll go back to the previous slide. Bonnie, K -Rod? Go first or you want me to go first? Yeah, whatever. K-Rod, go for it. You can go first. Oh, okay, so, yeah. So, well, you know, <laughs> The main issue here, the first, not the main issue, the first issue here is the infection, right? So it's, it's not just a, a post-traumatic arthrosis case, this is a post-traumatic infection. So we, we're going to have to do a, uh, an assessment of what's infected, what kind of the treatment is required, uh, treat the infection um, before we proceed with anything, any other alternative. So that alone is gonna take probably several weeks of management. So when I get a case like this, whether it's an ankle or for that matter, any other joint, the first thing I do is I perform a, uh, uh, I hold all antibiotics, right? Uh, and I perform a uh, debridement and culture. So I take a, it's very hard to, to assess what's going on without looking at this directly. Uh, if, if I have an MRI, great, an MRI, I don't find the MRI that terribly useful except to delineate the, 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 the margins of the signal change to see how high the infection goes into the, into the tibia or does it involve the entire tail? Does it involve the calcaneus? Or uh, the, the MRI can give you an idea of what the extent of your problem, but ultimately you need to debris this, take out any bone that's dead, uh, get deep cultures. And my first stage will probably be a, an aggressive debridement with some kind of uh, antibiotic uh, eluding uh, device, whether it's a solid filler with, with polymethyl methacrylate cement or beads or your choice of that. So then I would uh, manage the soft tissues after that first encounter. And, and then based on what I have, make decisions uh, based on what's left, correct? Whether it's uh, assess the, the infection, figure out the treatment, and then start talking in a few weeks after that as to what the, what the plan for at this point, a fusion or a shortening, or who knows what would be, you know, obviously some things are just not gonna be ever applicable. Uh, ankle replacements would never be a choice for this patient. And, uh, and, and some fix, some types of fixation, uh, if you cure the infection, you can consider a retrograde uh, hind foot nail or, or things like that. But I, I wouldn't get to carry that way thinking about my fusion method until I know, deal and control the infection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A great I point. agree. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Rodriguez. Um, and I think the the other consideration after 
you take mm -hmm. cultures just as, again as a point so um, all the registrars can um, uh, take note as well be on the same page is um, the treatment of the infection has to be quite aggressive and sometimes you have to give them if accessible um, IV antibiotics for quite some time um, six weeks two months to clear the infection uh, but at the same time Dr. Rodriguez brought up the very important point of just soft tissue management as a way to also contain your infection and control the infection. Um, a lot of times when you put a big piece of antibiotic cement, depending on the tissue, it may be able to hold, offer some sense of stability, um, have the tissues out to length um, if you're considering some sort of further st stabilization in the future. Uh, sometimes you may need to supplement it with some sort of external fixator in order to maintain the tissues out to length and to have the stability as well. Um, so one question I had for our Libyan colleagues is, um, I, I see this patient has probably had some sort of antibiotic cement placed um, either for the surgery or before. If you may have access to um, coating any of the implants you may consider putting in in the future, um, say like an antibiotic coated nail, um, and then we can, we can move on to see uh, what Dr. Yunez did for this case as well. Yeah, good question. Um, Dr. Yunus, do you have antibiotic coated nails, things like that, that you can use? Uh, no, unfortunately, we don't have. All right. Well, please tell us what you ended up doing. Okay. Uh, in this case, I discussed with the patient uh, that uh, I'm going to, to an ankle arthrodesis using uh, an external fixator, uh, some sort of uh, circular external fixator like uh, Elizarov external fixator. Uh, as you can see here, we go, uh, we uh, start the operation uh, doing an anterior approach to the ankle joint. And uh, we did uh, the breathing for the affected uh, tissue and remove the, uh, the bone cement from the uh, distal tibia. Uh, and uh, we applied a circular external fixator uh, with the three rods to do a gradual compression. Uh, which we did in on daily on a weekly basis uh, on each visit to the clinic, we did uh, a compression through the three rods, uh, one medial, one lateral, and the the, the last one in the posterior. Uh, uh, we continue on uh, IV antibiotic for after taking a cultural sensitivity test from the tissue. We start antibiotic and continue for uh, about one month on IV antibiotic. Then uh, we. Uh, uh, start oral antibiotic after improvement of the ESR and CRB. Start oral, oral antibiotic for about two or three. Uh, the patient uh, did well after three months. We removed the uh, external fixator and applied uh, below knee walking cast. And uh, this picture after uh, three months of uh, the operation, uh, as you can see, the soft tissue healing is good. Uh, and after one year of the operation, we have the last uh, X-ray mm -hmm. in which we can see the uh, arthrodesis is, uh, is mm -hmm. well united and the patient can wait very well uh, without pain. Uh, with, uh, he can return to his uh, activity, uh, sometime using crutches, sometime without using crutches. Thank you. Fantastic case. Any comment about the arthrodesis? Great, great result. Very, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Very nicely done. So in this, um, I guess the one, the one uh, point that maybe I, Dr. Chen, you can probably make this point better than I can um, about uh, shortening, shortening of the leg in this case, rather than trying to get it out to length um, you know, with, with some sort of allograft, I think obviously in the case of an infection, you would never want to do anything like that just because it's introducing another nidus for infection. So, um, you know, in, in some of the readings, you'll hear about doing like a bone block arthrodesis in cases where you have loss of height and collapse and things like that. We talked about doing bone block arthrodesis for like subtalar fusions, for example, in cases of Taylor neck fractures. Um, but in this case, you don't want to put a whole bunch of allograft in this because that's just going to be another source of infection. Dr. Chen, is that fair? Yeah, I think that's completely reasonable. I think um, yeah. for a severe case of infection, 
Um, you had alluded to some of the other options for um, having getting some length. I think sometimes you can get some through the external fixator. Sometimes you can take bone graft like from the fibula itself if um, if indicated to uh, supplement into the what was previously the ankle joint space. Um, if we were to kind of go through some of all the options, again, not always available everywhere, even here, it can be very expensive. Um, our options of bone block orthodesis with allograft, there are even titanium cages out there that are customized to the anatomy and the space that is left behind from infection or somebody with Charcot um, that you can pack with bone graft and um, actually insert into the space and even put the, the hardware into the titanium cage. But again, expensive, not always available. And I think very fair to not consider in the case of an infection. The other point to make um, in terms of a fusion, as you can see here, this patient more or less almost has a pan Taylor fusion in a way <laughs> because his ankle joints fused, but really all around is fused, uh, whether instead of infection, or if we were to wait this out for an even longer period of time, um, it's very common for adjacent joint arthritis um, for the registrars as well. That um, something to keep in mind for this patient, if they were to develop symptoms, is it's not surprising if you see that, well, it's not just the ankle joint that's stiff, but everywhere else is stiff. Um, you can see a tailor navicular joint, subtalar, um, and it's sort of like a domino effect and um, you can get a adjacent joint arthritis um, further down the other joints as well. Great point, thanks. All right, um, any, any comment from the Libyan side on this, uh, this case? Anybody would have done it any differently? I think this is a fantastic result, Dr. Sanad, very nicely done. But any comment from any of our Libyan colleagues? Uh, just a question. Do you see such cases in, uh, in the States? I mean, uh, we obviously, most of our cases is post-war injuries, you know, and uh, mostly is, um, are infected and the younger age groups. And uh, we have a problem with the rehabilitation here. You know, we don't have the kind of uh, well set, it, set, uh, or set up for uh, to deal most operatively with patients regarding, like we very deficient in occupational uh, therapy. So uh, what would you do? And uh, do you see a lot of cases like this in the United States or? We, we do see cases like this. Dr. Rodriguez, would you like to comment what on would, that? What, 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 would you do? what would you do for this case? Like just I make saying a they go for like <laughs> No, no, so, so I, it's, it's what I was saying before, right? We, we actually, we see quite often cases like this. Uh, in, in fact, I would argue to some degree, uh, perhaps even worse off, because our patients are not always young and injured and infected. They are all diabetic smokers infected with problems, right? So, so tragically, often when you reach, when you reach that group, uh, you're very close to an amputation when you have a, a, a severely infected foot of that degree. So we do our fair share of amputations in that regard. But for the, for the case that is salvageable, we do things very similar to, to, what, to what was presented here. In fact, this case was, was very well done. So yeah, I, I do emphasize the importance to the, manage the infection uh, first. So if this was my patient that I got out of referred or something like that, and I didn't ha had not treated his infection before, I would be very suspicious that the infectious is like the worst, the worst it can be. So I, I, I would stage this. Uh, it, it wasn't clear for me from the presentation whether it was a stage procedure or it was all done in one in one sitting. I would have I would have staged it just because I'm a little bit too conservative and have had <laughs> bad outcomes to teach me not not to try to uh, move things too fast sometimes, particularly in the diabetic patients. Uh, I, I would have staged it. I would have done uh, one, two, at times three operations to manage the infection as it was needed, then see what my soft tissue envelope allowed me to work with and proceed from there. A shortening mm -hmm. is perfectly appropriate, you know, and I, I, I tell my patients mm -hmm. a fusion, a, a shortened fusion mm -hmm. is, is, is functional. I can fix that with a small lift in a work boot mm -hmm. uh, and people can still be quite, can still manage, you know, it's, it, 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 it is, it is, um, I'm a trauma surgeon. I'm not a foot and ankle specialist, right? So, so I, I have a, a bit of a perspective that is a bit more pragmatic perhaps than some of my foot and ankle colleagues 
who, who can offer more, more sophisticated approaches at times. But um, I, I see my role as managing infection and giving the patient a limb that they can uh, you know, be functional or, or work on. And, that, and this, this case example is very much along the lines of the same thing I would have done. Shortening is certainly in my book. And K-Rod, how would you have immobilized the patient in between your debridements? Just put them in a splint and had them, uh, you know, stay in the hospital in between the debridements or sent them out? It, it, uh, good, it depends a little bit on the patient's resources and what I, we can do. So because they prolong, because sometimes the period between one intervention and the other is quite prolonged, our, our hospital system doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't facilitate prolonged admissions. Mm -hmm. So patients like this would end up uh, going to some kind of rehab facility. So then I have to judge. Is the care that's going to be provided in the rehab facility with a traditional bivalve cast going to be appropriate, or is it pay, is a stability issue or uh, a risk of making the soft tissues worse? If I feel that the, the, that the ankle is not going to be able to be managed in a manner that is stable to promote gradual improvement of the soft tissues, I would, I would consider an external fixator. Uh, but but the, the point is to stop the injury, right? You, you want to deal with the infection and you want things to start getting better from the moment you touch the patient. If there's any concern that things are not gonna get better because the ankle remains so unstable that the tissues remain inflamed despite the infection treatment, then, then you're not doing the patient a service. Great point. Uh, Dr. Ali, you had your hand up. Did you have a comment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, sir. I think uh, what the, Dr. Sanad uh, done uh, very well done, and I think a very good job he has done. And uh, I just would like to thank everyone participating in this lecture. My, uh, Dr. Sanad, uh, very very well done, uh, actually. And because uh, it, you can see it's a little bit common uh, problem we have met here in Libya: ankle fracture, especially open ankle fracture after motorcycle accident and car mm -hmm. accident. Uh, we have a lot of cases like that, and, and I am afraid that all of them almost end by the same result, uh, ankle arthrodesis. Thank you, Dr. Ikiran. Of course. No, thank you. Great point. It is a fantastically done case. Very well done, Dr. Sana. Can I make a point? You know, the, the, the soft tissue management doesn't only involve preserving the tissues. Many times you just can't preserve it. So, so we, we, we are fortunate that we have access to plastic surgeons that can do sophisticated free flaps and things like that that uh, often allow an, an additional option for salvage. Um, you know, we, we, we do a lot of uh, uh, free flaps on, 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 on ankles that are tissue deficient, and, and that allows a bit of, a, of a, uh, a, a, an additional margin for salvage that you wouldn't have if you didn't have that option. Yeah, thanks, Kira, that's a great point. Um, all right. Well, so for the interest of time, Dr. Chen, is, if it's okay with you, why don't we move on to um, Dr. Uh, Mustafa al khatef's presentation, if they're ready to present. Dr. al khatef are you ready? Yes. Yes. Yes, uh, we are ready. Uh, I'm sorry for uh, interruption. No, that's fine. So please uh, go ahead and share your screen if you can now. Okay. Okay, uh, we have uh, three, uh, three uh, cases. This case, uh, uh, just for discussion, because I don't uh, work, uh, don't do any work uh, for her. This is a uh, 15, five years old, uh, known case of diabetic. Uh, I think uh, 20 years old. 20 years uh, of, the, uh, of the type one uh, diabetic presented to me with uh, this uh, pictures, clinical and uh, x-ray. Uh, my question, what's the proper uh, management for this case? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the examination is? I mean, obviously they're standing here. Are they, are they painful? Are they able to put weight on this? Are they, do they she, feel unstable? Uh, as you know, doctor, uh, diabetic patient with charcoal, uh, I think uh, uh, haven't any pain. Uh, that's why she uh, can be, uh, weight bear uh, without pain, but uh, complaining from instability. Instability, great. Yeah. All right, um, here, can you go back one slide? 
So I'll, I'll pose that question to our foot and ankle colleagues in the audience, uh, Dr. Chen, Dr. Pineda, any, any comment on this case? Are these, is this something that you've ever seen before? Yeah, I think um, again, uh, maybe for more of the registrars in terms of thinking about um, Charcot, which most commonly is associated with diabetes, but not necessarily and not absolutely. Um, I think the goal of the treatment, whatever the treatment may be, is one, I kind of think of it as three things. One is um, you want to achieve a plantar grade foot. So if you think of a foot as a tripod with three points of the heel, the first metatarsal, the fifth metatarsal, is a person able to be plantar grade and therefore fit into um, not necessarily, you know, the, the best shoes in the world, but to be fit into some sort of shoe. And in the US here, we have, um, uh, some of these patients have access to larger toe box shoes. They can be customized. Um, and then the other two items I would mention is um, to make sure that they don't have any ulcerations um, or skin or wound compromise that can then lead to infection. Um, the most concerning being osteomyelitis um, further deeper within the foot. And then the third thing I think is some of the more subjective symptoms of the patient related to pain, um, instability, um, as Dr. Alcatef mentioned. Um, so those are sort of the three things I think about. Um, and then I think there's a question maybe in the chat box. So I just want to make sure we get to that. Uh, there are just some comments. Okay, just some in, comments. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh. Um, but I think I would answer those three questions first, and then that would... So for instance, if the patient doesn't have too much pain, if they're maybe in the acute Charcot phase, um, I think here we have the option of potentially treating them in total contact cast. I don't know if that's something feasible in Libya that um, our Libyan colleagues, do you guys do any contact cast? Do you do any type of walker boots like the crow walker for these patients? Um, uh, this is no, no. Yes. This is not uh, of my case uh, from uh, from the beginning. He, she just she just uh, come to uh, came to me uh, uh, since uh, one week, and I want to start uh, treatment. I see. So I think your question to the group then is, how would you fuse this? Is that your question, really? Yes. For surgery. Okay. So I think that the comments are coming in from the, from the thing. There are multiple methods yes. for, for fusing this, right? One is to do a nail. One is to do an Ilizarov, whether or not to use bone graft. Maybe we could ask Dr. Chen, Dr. Pineda, what, what would be your preference for this case? I, I want to just uh, to share me your experience about, uh, about the management of such cases of this. I think I think um, I would agree with Dr. Um, Jarala. I think he sent a message of um, I think he's alluding to arthrodesis of basically the calcaneus to the tibia, since there's not much of a talus remaining. Um, and here we have access to different types of fixation. Um, I don't think this patient looks like it's at least from what I can tell, it's not weight bearing x-ray per se, but depending on the amount of valgus varus deformity, sometimes if you take the fibula, um, that can allow you to adjust uh, for some of the deformity. And you can also use that bone from the fibula's bone graft. Um, otherwise, I think a, a retrograde nail, as um, Dr. El um, Ham Hamali mentioned, I think is very reasonable, um, basically to dock the calcaneus to the tibia. Um, and sometimes if if you need to, um, those nails have screw fixation options. Again, th this person doesn't necessarily have a talus, but you can try to also um, capture the, um, the rest of the hind foot um, in terms of the navicular. At the same time, something to think about is this person, I don't know the range of motion, but sometimes they can have sort of a pseudo arthrosis. And even though you fuse the calcaneus to the tibia, the patient's um, they don't mind having a little bit of motion and it's again, pseudoarthrosis. So it's sort of through the navicular against the tibia. One of my patients, that's what he ended up having. So it wasn't a fusion, but he felt like he had a little bit of motion at that um, particular articulation. Okay. Okay. 
this case, I will, um, sorry, I will agree with Bonnie. I, I, I mean, you can use an elixir of what somebody proposed in the chat. Um, I probably uh, will lean towards uh, uh, TC nail in this case, since I don't see the telos. Uh, and um, I think um, taking out the fibula, uh, it will help a lot in the approach and also to reduce the deformity based on the pictures of the skin. It seems like this is a long-term deformity. So I'm sure she has a lot of contracture in the soft tissues. So if you remove the fibula, it will be so much easier to correct the deformity and maintain the soft tissue envelope. And you can use that as a bone graph. I like that idea. Okay. So you would approach it laterally, take out the fibula, use it as bone graft, and then do a TC nail, essentially, yes. with, with an acute shortening as needed to correct the deformity and get some uh, some stability. Yeah, what, what are so you if thinking? You, if you look at these, like the patient's already short uh, in terms of, because it seems like it like it like in the, that's, I'm basing in the, in the lateral view. Um, so like probably it won't, we won't try it that much more, um, but definitely we'll be able to bring the hind foot back in alignment and the tissues like in the medial side, I'm sure like it, it will like it's already like sorry in the in the lateral side when you bring uh, the the all the hand foot back to the medial side, the fact that you don't have the fibula there give you that room to keep to bring the uh, like the whole hand foot back without doing major surgery to the soft tissue. Uh, because then like, um, I mean, I probably you cannot see, but like, uh, so you, if you take that, it's like just gaining some space. Uh, and then you can use that as a bone graph because it's nothing better than autograph uh, for any type of fusion. So I think that would be a very good technique and the patient will benefit from a TC. Now, I don't see any wounds or any alterations in the skin, even it seems like uh, she is a uh, diabetes based on the next slide. Um, so I think that would be a good option for her. I guess the, the, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's a great option. The, the point that, uh, Dr. Chen made about the navicular, that's sort of the question that I had, you know, do you have to fuse the, do you have to worry about that? I mean, there's obviously a lot of space there. The whole talus is being, you know, just disintegrated, you know, and so the navicular is sort of floating there. Bonnie, are you saying that you don't need to necessarily address that, that the motion that you get there? Uh, at the midfoot is is not necessary to to fuse. Yeah, I, I think I don't I don't know the absolute answer to that. I would say I don't know if there's enough evidence to say you have to fuse that segment um, or not. I think um, I think sometimes when there's a little bit of motion that is allowed through the foot, again, it protects a little bit from um, pseudo arthritis that can happen, or like adjacent joint arthritis. Excuse me, that can happen kind of down the line. Uh, because if everything is stiff, um, then, you know, then the next joint over is going to be stiff and potentially get arthritis because of increased wear and stress that it has to take to comp compensate for the fact that the rest of the foot is stiff. Um, the other thought I, I had too is, I don't know if um, our Libyan colleagues, like in addition to um, a nail, I think sometimes you can even fuse with screws. I think sometimes uh, I've done um, a few kind of retrograde Screw, like big caliber screws from the calcaneus up into the tibia. Um, so just to think outside of just a nail option, you can use screws. Um, we also here, and I'm curious to see what the Libyan colleagues um, may have access to as well. There are lateral plating options. If you're gonna go lateral anyway, and you're gonna take the fibula, you can also consider putting a lateral plate for your fixation. Good points, plenty of options. Dr. Okay. Farouk uh, Algandos, do you have your hand up? Did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, just uh, my concern is, uh, is there any absolute indication for surgery in such case? Because he's a pediatric, he don't have a pain, but he has a destructive arthropathy as we see with a, whether it's a charcoal or not, but the talus is totally absent. So whether we need to fix now or just we can treat conservative as Dr. Chan mentioned initially, we can just use the rocker walker and so such things because there's no uh, restriction of movement. There is no pain, so only instability. 
is there uh, a place to treat conservatively or not? Thank you. I think that's an excellent point. Um, and yeah, I think that's something to um, consider with the patient. Um, and again, going through kind of the three thoughts of, are they at risk of an infection? Is your foot plantar grade able to be put into a shoe? And are there symptoms potentially manageable with, as you said, a boot or um, some sort of brace support above the ankle level? Um, I think that's very reasonable to consider for this patient if they're not imminently destabilized, they're not imminently having oh, bone against the skin um, that could lead to um, a wound problem. Well, I think we've discussed yeah. this quite a yeah. bit. Dr. al Khatef, do you want to continue? What, it, what are you thinking that you will do for this patient? Doctor. Yeah. Dr. Kiran. Yes. I, 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 I want to uh, uh, answer uh, or, uh, or discuss about uh, which uh, doctors and professors say. Uh, this is case, as we know, is not an even case. Uh, because of uh, chronic diabetic and uh, it is uh, uh, diabetic uh, food. L uh, intervention with, uh, with uh, fibular graft, as mentioned, uh, I think, I think uh, we'll uh, go with uh, infection and uh, maybe end with the uh, amputation. Uh, another, another option, which is a non-operative treatment, uh, we will not reach the stable uh, ankle uh, and uh, we will go with uh, deformity and then with the uh, soft tissue uh, compromisation and we'll progress the uh, progress problem. So is, your, so is your plan then to do uh, an Elizarov? Is that what you want to do? Did you hear my Named, uh... Did you hear my question? I asked, are you planning on doing an Ilizarov for this patient? I mean, I agree with you that probably with, uh, you know, uh, symptomatic yes. instability, something probably should be done for this patient. If you're doing a big open approach, they're diabetic, and it's probably a brittle diabetes, the chance of infection is there. If you want to avoid that, I think an Ilizarov is reasonable. Is that your plan? Yes, this is my blood, bleed, bleedless surgery. All right. Well, please go ahead, okay. continue, continue. Okay, bleedless surgery. We want to, to reach stable ankle, arthrodesis, uh, uh, maybe ban arthrodesis uh, to the calcaneal cuboid and uh, teronaviculum with or without uh, bone graft. What will you use for bone graft? Yes, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we can do the, use uh, bone graft uh, to restore length of the lower limb. What, where are you taking your bone graft? Where? From, from uh, fibula, maybe from uh, iliac crest. All right. Well, so if you're taking it from the fibula, then you're opening, right? So uh, iliac crest, I guess, would be fine if you're trying to not open the ankle at all. Um, but yeah, tough case, very tough case. Do you want to continue? I, I think you have other cases as well. Okay, okay. And, uh, case uh, summary, in case uh, uh, number one, history, personal data, uh, 47 years old, female Libyan housewife. Uh, bust history, no case of type two diabetic, since 25 years, came to us with uh, Charcot ankle arthropathy, Rodeski 3A. Uh, X-ray shows complete resorption of the talus with various malalignment. Uh, uh, case number two, history of personal data, a 24 years old female Libyan, single, bust history known case of diabetic uh, for, since birth. Ankle shark heart arthropathy, Brodowski uh, type 3A. Can we save the limb in two cases? Yes, uh, I think uh, we can. Uh, first case, uh, we do uh, uh, and apply uh, Elizarov apparatus 
and uh, do gradual and do gradual uh, correction for uh, virus virus position of the food and do destruction compression technique patient patient uh, after weeks he can wait bear without pain uh, to enhancing the arthro arthrodesis and the ankle after that we remove elizarov and use the technique i think uh, uh, chinese uh, doctors used it and uh, dr jamal uh, husni from egypt uh, my master taban uh, we do uh, multiple k wires passing from calcaneus uh, to, to tibia calcaneo uh, tibial arthrodesis and uh, and to get and uh, uh, to get a st uh, stability after removing the x-ray, uh, after uh, removing the Elizarov, uh, after two months, we will remove the uh, K-virus. This is the case number one. Very interesting. Do you, do you have uh, tibio tail uh nails uh, in Libya? We, uh, we have, but not familiar with it. I see. The benefit, benefit from K virus, uh, 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 we will do multiple uh, binning uh, to enhancing the uh, 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 arthrodesis in this, in this time. And when we remove the K virus, we'll do refreshment again. I see. Better than, yeah. All right. Yeah, it's a Case technique that two. I haven't seen before. Yeah, please continue. Case number two, do uh, do the same the same uh, procedure, which do in uh, case na number one. Patient after three days of, of surgery, he can walk without uh, without uh, walker and without being comfortable. This is the case. Most of. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting cases. Um, any any comment from our foot and ankle surgeons from Harvard side? I think it's great to um, keep in mind the Elizarov or any uh, other frames, including static frames, can be a very good option for these patients as well. Um, I think in in the U.S., like uh, Mickey Pinzer um, in Illinois, is one of the big um, proponents of this technique as well. He is probably one of the preeminent. Um, foot and ankle surgeons who does a lot of diabetic Charcot reconstruction. And he, this is one of his uh, primary go-tos when he manages patients um, in the U.S. as well. So his, his name is M Michael Pinzer. Um, he's written extensively on this topic if people are interested as well. And Bonnie, can you just summarize the technique again for us? It's using Ilozorov to correct and then putting pins up? Yeah, um, similar. I don't know if he always uses pins. Sometimes he manages the patients definitively in a frame. So I think um, similar in terms of um, using um, an Elizarov or some sort of static frame in order to uh, correct the deformity, minimize um, soft tissue, um, uh, sort of dissection risk of infection for these patients. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Sanad Yunus, you presented an excellent case using an Ilizarov. Any comment on these cases? Yeah, thank you. I, I have uh, just one. Uh, I, I would like to ask you, uh, Kachef. Why Dr. Sanad, we, we can't hear. For, uh... Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Mustafa. Why did he remove the Elizarov before uh, completion of the arthrodesis and uh, replace it with the uh, K-wire cast? What's the rationale behind uh, the Elizarov? Okay, uh, this is a Chinese technique. Uh, the benefit of uh, K-wires, uh, they found there is refracture when removing removing the uh, Elizarov after uh, after uh, X-ray union. 
This is one point. Second point, uh, we ensure alignment and do refreshment when introducing the K-virus in the first time and refreshment again to decide when removing the K-virus in uh, uh, the end of uh, procedure. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting case. I think I think they're both very well done. Um, and obviously, uh, you don't have long term follow up for these patients, but I assume that they're both doing well now. They've achieved fusion. Yes, there is a continuous follow up. And how uh, how least, are they? Uh, at least uh, two times a uh, weekly. And oh, so these patients still have their frame on right now. Yes, yes, yes. still in uh, on follow up. I see. Well, uh, you know, we'd certainly love to see the outcome. Please do share uh, if you can. Uh, I would love to hear what happens with these patients and how they do. And I'd, I'd love to hear what you end up doing. Yeah, with, with that, uh, with that 20 or uh, 40 year old diabetic, however old that patient was who uh, you're still deciding. I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you end up deciding to do for that person. Um, if you open it and take the fibula as graft, my tendency would be, since you've already opened it, to just go ahead and correct the uh, malalignment and fuse it maybe with a TTC nail. Um, if you're going to do the ill, is are off to slowly correct the deformity. Yeah, I'd be very curious to hear what you end up deciding to do there. We just fearing from uh, soft tissue. Yeah. Uh, I can't open the skin. I think that I, I will go with the, uh, uh, and end with the amputation. Yeah, I know. It's You're opening Pandora's box if you cut the skin in that patient, I understand. But of course, if you're going to get a fusion, you have to do some joint preparation. You have to do something there, right? So if you're going to do something, you know, I think you're already opening Pandora's box. D Dr. Lorena, any comment on that? You know, I think, um, as Bonnie was saying, um, we can not forget uh, frames as a very uh, like a very useful tool, especially with patients uh, with diabetic or neuropathy, which is so easy to get any uh, sub tissue um, problems. Uh, I feel like it's a it's a good option. Just um, and one thing that I try to keep in mind is always I think uh, it uh, has to be a long discussion with the patient previous to surgery to make sure that they are aware uh, that. They like what entails to have a frame and that is going to be for their own good, but just they are aware. Uh, so uh, when they wake up from surgery, um, the shock is not as impressive because it requires a lot from the patient uh, to be with the frame for several weeks. And I feel like even if you do a great job, uh, they, they, uh, they have to do their part, like in any surgery. But I feel like here, and uh, their role can be even more important um, with taking care of the frame and be aware that this is just for a few months. Um, so that's really the one thing that I have learned um, like through fellowship and experience with patients that make sure you, you set the expectations and um, that they are aware of the benefits of the frame. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. The, the, other, the other thing I always, and not to be very negative, but just to be realistic with, with my patients from the first day I meet them, if they have a problem like this, I always bring up that there is a risk of amputation, that they will lose their limb. Um, and again, I think it's important to take into the cultural and the patient individual um, consideration of that. But I think it's always something that is important each time. It's like, okay, well, we're doing pretty well, but if there's a if there's a bump in the road where they may not be doing so well, um, I think it's it's always important that they have that understanding of the possibility. Yeah, I think in this in this case with this patient, you know, if they are not willing to accept the risk that there is a likelihood of amputation at the end of this process, then maybe putting them into a crow walker or something that just provides some stability and just letting them ride this out, you know, um, is is the right move. Um, yeah, I mean, you, there's no right answer. I think the real point here for all of our trainees is, as you can tell from this discussion across two different continents, is that there's no correct answer in this case. It's a very tough case, and it depends on what the patient wants, what your abilities are and your comfort level is, all of these different things, and you're taking a chance in either direction. 
Um, well, okay, uh, I'd like to move on now maybe to talk about some PLON cases because we have some great cases and we're running out of time here. So if that's all right with everybody, um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ken Rodriguez to, uh, to begin his presentation. Uh, K-Rod, is that okay? I have your slides here, I can share them for you. Okay. Thank you, Kieran. Um, yeah. Okay, we, we can move on to the first slide. So I, I'm presenting a, what is really a very typical case for, for our urban Boston practice. This is a, a, the story of a 51-year-old uh, male uh, laborer who is diabetic. And for that matter, a, a poorly controlled diabetic. He, he's a, a recent uh, immigrant who has not ha doesn't have many resources. And this was his first job in the United States working for a construction company that hired him to work on, on manual uh, labor type of activities. So he was being transported to his uh, work site and, and he fell off the pickup truck landing on his ankle and obviously having a, a, a significant injury with pain, deformity, and it was an open fracture. He was picked up and sent to uh, one of the local clinics where he was splinted, given some pain medication, some antibiotics, and his tetanus prophylaxis. And then he was sent to us for, for further care. This story happens, you know, hundreds of times in our institution. Very, very, very typical, typical story. Can we go to the next to the next slide? So the the I, don't have, I apologize for not having an image of the actual injury, uh, but this fellow had a a very um, a transverse ten centimeter laceration, mostly medial, uh, from his uh, uh, essentially do almost almost half the circumference of his of his ankle, and in addition in addition to that he had a second laceration about a centimeter uh, in length uh, about you know three or four centimeters more proximal and he had a modest amount of contamination meaning dirt and things like that so this is his uh his uh films as he arrived um and after his initial splinting so it's obviously a distal um uh, tibia fracture uh if you switch back and forth to the other AP view, uh, it's a little hard to tell, but, but it is, it is intra-articular. Um, so at this point, uh, the, the, these, these fractures in, in, in our institution are first seen by our uh, resident, usually a, a trainee, perhaps in the second year of training. And they, they call their senior resident. Uh, and then they, after they do an initial set of assessments, they call the uh, the orthopedic attending on call, which happened to be uh, me. So um, I, I, I would, I, I guess I can ask, uh, what would be the first step in management at this point? I'll, I'll ask uh, any of the uh, trainees that may be participating. I'm happy to jump on me. Dr. Rodriguez. Go ahead, Aaron. First step, uh, once this patient arrives, probably uh, since he already received the antibiotics, we can rely on that, uh, assess the neurovascular status of the limb, the compartments, um, irrigate and wash out the wound down in the emergency department, and make sure it's well splinted and Probably that the wounds are covered with a sort of better than impregnated gauze or something. And while also try to tee up the patient uh, to go to the operating room uh, as soon as possible for either, uh, depending on the soft tissue status for an external fixator and irrigation and the treatment of the open wound, or if the soft tissue is allowed for a, an early definitive fixation, which uh, based on the story of this patient, doesn't seem like it would be the case. Maybe also get some a prophylactic fasciotomy. So I'll, I'll give you a bit more information. 
Well, so, uh, Kayrod, well, actually, one second. We have a, a, a hand raised from Dr. Farouk Algandos. Uh, Dr. Farouk, did you have a comment to make here? Uh, actually, uh, yeah, I just say reply, Dr. Rodriguez, regarding what we can do. My concern initially is the infection is the first, and then is the, the soft tissue. Uh, at the end, I will consider the, uh, the uh, restoration of the uh, fracture and uh, stabilization. But in the meantime, as the uh, doctor just mentioned, we have to give intravenous antibiotic. We have to irrigate the wound because he has a lacerated wound. It's almost circumferential. So we need to clear out the infection first. And in the second time, we have to, to, to uh, what you call to respect soft tissue because we need the vascularity there at the fracture site. So we will fix your hand. Uh, I use the external fixator and just to stabilize the, uh, the fracture and to get the joint congruity as much as I can. But at the same time, I need to consider the infection and uh, the soft tissue respect is that my uh, flag which I run over. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Good point. Here, I'll take it away. Oh, I, I entirely agree. So, 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 so what I was going to ask Aaron is, if he will order any additional studies at this point, or he would just call me so we can take this patient to the operating room uh, sooner rather than later. I, I would get a, a CT scan uh, as well, just to have a, a good property plan. Uh, okay. So, so I'm happy you mentioned that because we didn't get a CT scan. In, in fact, I told the resident not to get a CT scan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at, at that time, because it was apparent, right, from the nature of the injury that I was going to stage this case. So I thought, let's not uh, get a CT scan, even though it's not a significant use of time, we could have easily afforded to have a CT scan. But I thought, since the patient is going to the operating room anyway for a first stage, let me at least put him in an external fixator and define a little bit better what the what the alignment is so that my CT scan would render perhaps more useful data for a later reconstruction. So, 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 so it, it, just a, a minor point, but something, something to, to do. So we, so we actually did go to the operating room for the debridement and the fixation. And if I could go to the next image. So, so the first thing I, I did, it, this was a very, a very floppy uh, limb. It was very, very unstable, not, not only because it was it had a, a, a fibula and a, and a tibia fracture, but it also had a big laceration. So a lot of the soft tissue envelope was just not there. So the first thing we did clearly was apply a, a simple ankle spanning frame after the first irrigation. Then we expanded the wounds more proximally and clean it up. And then I decided, which I not often do, but because I and, 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 and but because I knew that most of my work would still be uh, perhaps uh, anteromedial or anterolateral, I, I performed a very uh, minimalist to the degree that I could uh, alignment and, and fixation of the fibula, just to just to facilitate the stability and restore a little bit of the anatomical length. So and, and then I had to decide. Well, I have this huge open window into my medial ankle at this point. It, when you have that, let's just call it a natural exposure, uh, it, it, it can become very tempting to start doing things. So, so it, it would be very easy for me to start putting screws in place. After all, it, it was there looking at me. And, and, you, and I had to resist that. And we always joke with my colleagues that before we have a case like this, we, 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 we define a non-escalation pact to kind of make sure that we, that we don't overdo uh, are not tempted to, to do too much. But we did, but what I did do, and if you could move to the next slide, is I, I took that opportunity to use the joint the best I could, because when it's fresh, as, as we discussed in one of those papers, it, it actually is kind of much easier to obtain alignment, particularly through a, through a large wound. So, so I had to balance the need to, you know, the opportunity to obtain a better reduction versus the sequela of potentially putting hardware on a, on a site that was gonna get infected. So I picked a middle ground where I just applied a couple of screws enough to, to, to align a little bit the joint 
because I knew it would be a long time before I came back to do this. This was not going to be a few days of delay. This fellow was going to have, is going to be on the long end of the waiting time before his stage procedure. So, so we left the operating room that first day with something that looks like this. W would anyone offer a, a different path to, to, to manage this at this point acutely? I think these can be be tricky. I think as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned, sometimes even when you put these pilon fractures into an external fixator, they're still floppy and you can't hold the alignment or the reduction. Um, so I think sometimes, yeah, I agree, I don't usually put in hardware until more definitive fixation. Um, and I like to think that I can hopefully manage this um, sequentially and do the definitive fixation um, personally. Um, some, sometimes it's not possible and we receive patients who have had hardware done elsewhere um, and then they get transferred over. Um, so I think my usual preference in that case is that, that they didn't have any hardware and then we kind of start um, a little bit more afresh. I think another option that can be possible, again, not knowing you know, exactly what things look like in this case are that sometimes skinny wires can help hold the reduction as well. So um, in addition to considering internal fixation along with your external fixation is if you're solely just doing external fixation, you could consider a hybrid um, with the Steinman pins, the larger caliber pins, but also with skinny wires is another option. That, that well, is great advice, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Mohammed. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kirod. I'll admit to Bonnie that I didn't think of that. <laughs> I learned it from you, I think. <laughs> but, but I'm getting old, Bonnie. So, so, so in any case, that's what we did. Uh, any other comments for, for, from the participants? I also have to say, like, I'm going to teach my residents the span, scan, and plan. And that's a great mnemonic. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, a lot, a lot of our colleagues from Libya have said the same thing. I, I'm, yeah. I'm curious if anybody on the Libyan side would have uh, tried an Ilizarov for this. Sounds like nobody. Okay, all right, all right, let's move on. So, so what, one thing about the Ilizarov, I one of my colleagues is, is very expert at doing the spatial frames and so forth, but this soft tissue looked so bad that we thought this man was going to end up with a free flap. And we decided against, uh, it's, it's hard to do a free flap when you have an elicera frame on. Yeah. So that was one of the things that, 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 uh, that we were considering. In any case, can I have the next slide, please? So then that evening, we went to the CT scan. And, and I, I think we addressed this question uh, ahead of time uh, as, as uh, I did, I did the CT scan after the fact because I knew we were going to go to the operating room and I knew I wasn't going to fix this definitively. So we got the CT scan and let me share with you a few slides of the CT scan. So this, this is the, the left side shows the cut very much at the level of the joint. And it pretty much shows the typical three or four part uh, fragments, right? The, the, the anterolateral corner is completely off and fairly displaced. Posterior lateral corner of the tibia also appears to be uh, a bit disjointed. Thankfully, there, there seems to be some degree of syndesmotic alignment, but the syndesmotic side of the, of the in the tibia side is, is disrupted. Uh, the, the, one, the panel on the right is a little bit more proximal. You can see how the displacement increases as it becomes proximal. And if you could share the next slide, Kieran, that's kind of kind of what we have. It's, it's, it's obviously a lot of comminution in the middle aspect of the joint, uh, but but to the, but to the degree that I invested in those in those screws, I, I thought the, the investment was worthwhile, or, or it would have been much more displaced. Uh, whether I will come to regret that or not, we'll find out in a few slides. Yeah, so can, and one more one more slide, please, and and then next slide, and then this is this is just two or two couple of views telling you that despite my my best attempt at using those screws to line things up, it really looks, you know, while, while the joint may be a little bit better, it, it's really hard to get, to fix this, uh, you know, and, and keep it in, in any kind of 
aligned position just with the external fixator and a couple of screws. So even when the when the joint in the in the C arm images appear to be satisfactory, it, it really it, it, it's not quite when when you look at it in detail. And the three dimensional function of the CT scan allows you it humbles you quite a bit all the time. So um, at this point, the this this patient went went away, and it, it took eight weeks, two months two months before he actually came back from his stage procedure. And this was not just because of the soft tissues. There were a few other social complications involved. I, I had mentioned that he was a, an immigrant and, and then he, he, he worked at a, at a site that was one of the islands that are off the coast of Massachusetts. So he went there and then he couldn't come back to Boston. He skipped his surgical schedule a couple of times. Then he got depressed and said he, he wanted to commit suicide. So he got interned in some kind of facility for a couple of weeks. And in the end, it took like two months before I got to him. And now he presents fixation. So I wonder if anyone could comment or is willing to comment. You know, I, I think that two months just makes just attenuates my optimism to obtain a good reduction significantly. Uh, I, I wonder if anyone else feels the same. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to obtain a reduction that far out because things um, are going to be scarring and, and so forth. In, in retrospect, perhaps I should have put a bit more effort in my initial attempts. Thankfully, he did not get infected, and his wound remained intact and viable. Kerod, we have a hand up from uh, Dr. Ali. Ali, would you like to say anything? Uh, 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 yes, yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Dr. Kiran. Yes. yes. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez is done is the best, I think. And uh, I think there is no any rule for Elizarov in this case. Uh, the most important thing, uh, as the, my colleague has, have mentioned, you have to take the care of soft tissue. Maybe you need some plastic surgery or whatever, but you have to take a care of soft tissue and as long as you take care of soft tissue, the soft tissue will take care of the bone, I think. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez, is what he has done. I think it is the best for the patient. Thank you very much again. Uh, th th thank you for that comment. And you're absolutely right. Uh, and and uh, to some degree, perhaps the reason why his soft tissue did so well is because he had these other uh, social issues that delayed his surgery even more than what, what I would have initially delayed it. So, so the good thing, out of this unusually long delay is that his soft tissues were fine. The bad thing is that he still has a broken, <laughs> a broken leg with an ankle that's not quite ideally reduced. And now I have to deal with that. So he came back and I, I carefully uh, approached this, uh, uh, you know, his tissues were better, but not perfect. So I tried to do this as minimally as I could. I, I try to reduce that anterior lateral corner plus minus satisfaction in doing that. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, I, I, I applied an anterior lateral plate and I slid this up through an accessory incision so that it wouldn't be uh, uh, very burdensome for the soft tissues. And, and overall, I was actually quite, quite fond of the result. It, it seemed, at least on the, on the imaging obtained with the Fluoroscan, it, it, it seemed appropriate. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So anyway, off he goes, right? Uh, and then he comes again because he has all these access issues. He didn't come very often. He came back uh, five months later, right? Uh, and he was actually ambulating without pain. He had no crutches. And I thought, my goodness, this man has healed and he doesn't know how lucky he, he has been. And look at the next slide, please. And this is kind of how he looked at five months. And I'm thinking, well, you know, he's obviously gonna get some post-traumatic arthritis. His alignment looks okay. His, his, mor his mortis looks okay. His lateral view looks okay. You know, not terrible. And he's walking without pain. Now remember, he, he's diabetic, so that he may have been a little bit neuropathic because he was a very poorly controlled diabetic. 
Uh, so, I, so I, I wouldn't take the no pain sign as a as a pos, as a very optimistic thing. So, that, do people think this is healed now? I'm interested in it with an assessment. It, it, it's, it's a, a gentleman who's diabetic who's been walking without pain for five months shows up with these X-rays. Have we won? Are we healed? Dr. Farouk, you have your hand up. What would you say? Yes. Uh, yeah, Karen. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, actually, I just want to comment about it. If uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, uh, he gave me uh, an excuse. Uh, <laughs> actually, you have done well with the uh, with the fixation, but my comment is, I look, I see there is some shortening of the tibia because the you can see the fibula is not at the uh, at the stem level with the tibia in term of the articular congruency. So. I will assume this will end up with the arthritis because we we uh, I I assume to put the bone graft for the tibia to get the length is uh, as we say it's uh, the uh, ankle is uh, completely uh, restored. Here I can see a fibula it, it's down a bit and it's compressing on the ankle at the lateral aspect. So I assume the patient will end uh, now he's okay but maybe later he will end up with the arthritis. I don't know. Uh, thanks. Well, that, that's a very good observation that he appear, his, his tibia side appears to have settled and there's already a hint, a hint of barrens here. But because he wasn't having pain, I thought, oh, well, this is what we have. And I was actually pleased. I advised him he was going to get arthritis, but there's not much we can do. So, so anyway, off he goes. Uh, next slide, please. Well, Kirad, we also have a hand up from Dr. Khaled Aneba. Um, Dr. Aneba, did you want to make a comment? Uh, yes, uh, that's a great case, looks great. Um, I've got a little bit of concern that these metal were uh, that particular place were rigid, and I have a suspicion and a nasty feeling that it's not going to work. And I hope I'm wrong. Thank you, that's all I'm going to say. Yes. All yeah. right. Go ahead, Kieran. No, so so yes. Well, the story is not over yet. Let's go to the next slide, please. So so now he comes back seven months later uh, after his initial injury, uh, again with no pain, but he tells me his ankle is bending, <laughs> uh, and it's it's actually embarrassed and, and, and misstated that. Go, go go to the next slide, please. Right. So now things are not as happy anymore. Right. So that, that early, early uh, virus collapse uh, is worse. Now he's in more virus. But if you're, if you're observant, there's a little arrow there. Can you show the lateral view? Ah, see? So now, now we are dealing with a non-union. So, so uh, uh, Kirad, a very astute member of our uh, conference, uh, Dr. Mazen Youssef made the comment in your prior x-ray what about the posterior cortex? And so here you can see that it's shortened even more. And I think what you were picking up on, Dr. Mazin, is that the cortex, it was settling a little bit. And I think that was the early sign of what now has progressed to a various uh, malunion or non-union. So what do we do now? I could use the opinions and the help. Any comments from our faculty in Libya? What would you do in this case? <laughs> I think that's, uh, sorry, go on, Muhammad, you go ahead. I think that's, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I think uh, it's clearly um, a rigid fixation. This place are notorious. Um, this is like a fairly predictable outcome with a place like this, with that sort of working length. And, and a biology that is, is difficult to control. I think you probably your uh, ring fixator or reconstruction spray is the way forward. From now. Take all the metal out of the reconstruction Thank you. So you would you would go for a frame? Oh, sorry, Kieran, I didn't I didn't get all the detail of, of the comment very well. 
Yeah, I think um, uh, the comment was that uh, uh, all the hardware should probably come out and a ring external fixator should be applied to correct the deformity and then uh, treat the, the fracture non-union. So, so I, I, I talked, we, 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 you know, we talked to the patient about that and he was adamant against any kind of ring, ring uh, expert type of device. Remember, he, he was having a bit of psychological issue and he had been already uh, expressed some, uh, some uh, self-harm ideation. And, and the only thing he would accept is something that, that, that did not involve external fixation. So, so, you know, at this point, we are, I, I looked at this problem more from a salvage perspective, right? You know, at the, 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 this is going in that I, I thought about perhaps doing a primary fusion at this point, that retrograde, you know, but I had to obviously, I, I had to culture him, make sure he wasn't infected. That was my, my first concern. Thankfully, I, uh, I took the hardware out, they obtained the cultures. And I believe a couple of days, a few days later, I came back and I, I did a, um, a fibular osteotomy uh, to kind of regain some alignment, uh, not ideal again, but I was able to, to uh, bring, bring it together with some bone graft and, 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 and achieve what I think now is, is at least a heel tibia. The next step, right, will be most likely a, a fusion uh, down the line. But but this is where we are now. Now we have now his tibia appears to be healed, but his fibula did not heal. But he he he'll just have to live with that. I'm afraid. Um, I'm not going to be doing more more incisions on him. Uh, if I can get him to to heal and ha have this uh, tolerate this for a for a year or so, I'll bring him back and I'll do his his ankle fusion. He may be at this point uh, moving back to Brazil, where he's originally from. So, if anyone's from Brazil, please send me your email, <laughs> and, uh, and I'll send. Maybe we can connect for him. But but th th this is how you know the point of illustrating this case is that things go wrong everywhere and in many different ways, and and uh, uh, the most remarkable thing of this case is that he didn't get infected. Uh, or, or if it was an infection, is not one we could diagnose, uh, despite the open nature of the wound, despite the contamination, despite the soft tissue damage. I, I think at this point we've been able to give him uh, some degree of stability, uh, not a good ankle, but we preserved his soft tissues, and so far we've won. Uh, I would give myself, I would, if I were to grade myself, uh, it from I would give myself a a C plus on this one, but we had some limitations imposed by the nature and the expectations of the patient as well that kind of precluded some of our options. Very humbling. Yes, like all these cases usually are. <laughs> um, any, any final comments from the, from the participants? I, I mean, yeah, I agree. Um... Dr. Rodriguez, like a uh, feel one fractures are very humbling always. Um, and sometimes you try really hard, but the damage are right there in terms of a uh, joint. Um, I have a question. So since he never had pain, was he ever compliant with non well bearing at the beginning of the like the first surgery? Or oh, he, he was compliant with his care. He just didn't have. I don't think he understood his diabetic condition very well. And, you know, we managed his sugars when we had access to it. But when he was out in, and he was at work, he was actually a construction, a, a working in our crew at a Martha's Vineyard. So I'm, I have no idea if he even had medical care when he was there. He got more medical care when he was institutionalized for his suicidal ideation than any other point. So it, it's a difficult case. And, um, uh, you know, I, th I think if he really moves back to his family in Brazil, he'll probably be, be better taken care of than he was by himself without family in, in, in the vineyard. Would, uh, would anybody like to comment on the role of doing a, a fusion early in this patient? Yes, because that was my other option, and I was contemplating that for a while. Dr. Zayad, any, uh, any comment on this case? Yes, uh, thank you for Dr. Uh, for this uh, 
nice uh, case regarding the tibia plafond. But I want to ask two questions. First one for uh, why, what's the, the type of approach you use it and why not use double plating for such a case? Because this is uh, interarticular complex C3 type. And the second one, uh, when and you decide to fix the fibula, does, I mean, and does uh, every type of fracture, tibial, tibial bone fracture, needed for uh, fixation of the fibula? Thank you. Sir. Thank you. No, so I, I don't fix the fibula uh, initially as part of my external fixation. I'd say, I, I think it's like, if I do it two out of 10, it's, it's, it's often, it's a lot. I, I did it in, in this particular case because it was a very unstable distal limb because I was worried that we would not be able to come back to his tibia in a long time. And, and, and if, if it had to remain in external fixation for a prolonged period of time, having the added length restoration and stability offered, if modestly so, by a fibula would be a good idea. Um, in terms of a double plating, yes, that's always an option. But for me to put a double plate on this gentleman in the first operation, I would have had to do like an additional uh, posterior lateral exposure. I wasn't going to open his medial side. And then you have a medial denution from the injury and then a posterior lateral exposure. Then before, before long, you are, you are iatrogenically, you know, it, it, it compromising a lot of the, a lot of the vascularity from the, from the muscle envelope. So I, at least I was counting that he was getting, he had healthy tissue in the back and I didn't want to interfere with that. So I, I used one of those fancy locking plates and thought that would work. And the reality is, look, it, the stability lasted for five, for five, seven months. So, so I don't think it was a stability rigidity issue as much as a soft tissue healing diabetes issue. And um, ultimately at the end, I, I ended up, you know, seven months later, I did, his soft tissues were much healthier. So I was able to more comfortably open the medial side uh, and, and double play them to some degree. Dr. Farouk, did you have a comment to make? Uh, yeah, Karen. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Rodriguez for uh, this interesting case because uh, it's uh, a comprehensive case for ankle injury and even we learn a lot today from the this, the, uh, the uh, what you call the restoration of the length. From here, I guess the failure is there because there's two issues, main issues here. It's the biology is the first because it's an open fracture and there is some contamination as well. So still we assume that the non is there. And in the meantime, in the second time is the uh, second thing is the restoration of the length because in the fracture of the tibia, we have to restore the length first. So I guess here there is some, as I mentioned, there's some shortening, so the ankle is not restored well. Even this is maybe it's a cause of the failure. Uh, I think I will not go for arthrodesis yet, but I still I have a chance to do some osteotomy for the fibula and shortening of the uh, lateral uh, aspect of the uh, of the ankle to get the length for the tibia. Even will end up with shortening, or I graft the tibia and do the double plating as still mentioned right now. Whether one of two, but I need to get the equal, the, uh, what you call the stabilize the, uh, the ankle in the equal uh, position. I mean, in, in, the, in the normal uh, congruency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Yeah, I think, you know, good, good points that you made, but uh, I would also say that the biggest challenge for this patient in addition to the nature of the injury is the nature of the host, you know, his brittle diabetes, his inability to non weight bear, his complex social situation, all of these things, no matter how good of a surgeon you are, um, can, can confound uh, your best efforts. And I think that that's what we saw here. We saw a battle between uh, many, many different difficult foes. Um, so uh, shall we move on to the next case? K-Rod, did you have any final word to say about that case or should we move on? No, I, I just, I just want to let folks know that these are tragically very common 
and, and, and here in the United States, you know, we we um, it, we deal with a lot of older uh, workers who, who you would like to think that their health is better managed than what it often is. But even even often with with access to health care, there are so many so many comorbidities associated with some of our patients that uh, that makes makes this always an ongoing battle in many in many fronts. Thanks, Kirod. All right. Well, the next presentation I have is by uh, Dr. Zayad Bohalike. Uh, I have that right here. Um, if that's okay, Dr. Zayad, I was going to share your slides for you, unless you would like to share it for yourself. Okay, I will go to the uh, topic uh, as early as possible because the time uh, yes, is yes. late. Yeah. Okay, now. Uh, uh, yes, uh, from the history, uh, the data from presented with the patient, 29 years, shown for you. Is this slide clear? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can see the slides. Just wait. See? Oh, I, I have, uh, Dr. Zayad, I have your slides up already. I'm sharing them. So go ahead. I think uh, there's some problem for me. Uh, no, and, uh, for me, not, not uh, start sharing screen. Please. Well, I, I, I'm sharing the screen already. I don't know if you can see my slides. But I can't control uh, for the slides for me. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'll let you. Um, actually, I'm, I'm sorry to do this, but I just got a message um, from uh, Dr. Salem Langi that he has to run and would like to present his slides now. It's a relatively quick case. If that's okay, Dr. Zayad, I'm sorry to do that. Um, is it okay if um, uh, Dr. Langi, are you ready to present? And then uh, Dr. Zayad will do your case next. Yes, okay, no problem. Okay. Dr. Lange, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, this is a, this is a case that I've seen uh, came to my clinic. He's thirty five year old patient with a one and a half year old history of uh, gunshot injury to his right leg. Uh, he had undergone uh, underwent uh, de uh, deprivement and ex expanding stain of fixator was applied initially uh, as initial treatment in, uh, in another medical in another center. Uh, subsequently, the wound uh, got infected and a few deprivations were done uh, over the a few months later and patients stayed on the external fixator for the whole period of time, for the whole half and one and a half year. On presentation to my clinic for the first time, patient was not happy about having the external fixator, was depressed. Uh, uh, he just wanted to get rid of the external fixator and go back to his normal life, to his own sport. Uh, he was only complaining of uh, mild pain, at, especially at the pin, uh, pin insertions. Uh, on the examination, uh, there was noticed that some pin track infection was noticed with small tender swelling over the distal area of the leg. His routine uh, blood, no other significant uh, finding on his exam examination. Uh, his routine blood tests were remarkable. Uh, the ESR CRP was uh, slightly elevated. I've done the X-ray and CT scan uh, for him. That's his uh, X-ray of AP lateral. And you can see the distal tibia and fibula, kind of like the long fractures. And there's malunion on the lateral side and on the AP as well. That's his state for of his condition for the past year, year and a half. This is the CT scan done. Maybe I have better figure. This is the coronal side you can see there's nothing much left from his distal uh, tibia, his ankle joint. So uh, uh, again, this is a kind of uh, common injuries that we've seen 
especially the conflict or conflict area um, zones in Libya. And I would like to ask about you opinion about this. What would you do in this case? He's a young guy, he's, he's, he just want to get rid of this extended fixator by any means. He's been so many times, he was shopping around doctors, even in Libya and abroad. And that's his final uh, results after a year and a half trips around the doctors. I have discussed with him options that I, I thought uh, maybe I'll ask your opinion about that if possible. So just to clarify, this, this wound is still drainage, it's still infected? It's still drainage, it's still infected? It's still, yeah, from pintract infection. Uh, there was not some, some tender swollen area around the distal end of the of the leg, you know, the swollen, it felt a bit of pain there, but not more discomfort than pain. But there's some pin track coming from infection from the pins coming out. But there was no sinus from the area of the fracture. It's only from the pin track. Yeah, well, I think obviously the frame needs to come off. Um, and, uh, you know, to assess what's going on inside. I mean, if it's completely unstable, and uh, whatever fibrous tissue is in this, you know, area of resorbed bone, if that is also infected, then I think unfortunately this patient is looking at an amputation to control infection and prevent, prevent it from spreading. If, however, it's clinically healed, you know, and, and is not painful, um, the X fix, of course, needs to come off. But I don't think I would be trying to put any internal fixation in this or trying to bone graft it after what's gone on. Certainly not right after taking out the X-Fix. I think my plan would be to, uh, um, to let everything calm down after the X-Fix comes off and see how he does clinically. Um, K-Rod, what, what are your thoughts? Yes, um, my, my focus would be on infection management first, along the lines of the conversation with the first, with the first case that we presented. So, so, so yeah, I will take out the X-Fix, I will do an aggressive debridement, deep cultures, uh, and, and uh, if, if my first impression is that this is uh, salvageable, I, I will start again with an antibiotic spacer, treat the infection, allow the soft tissues to to define themselves. This 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 has a I noticed from the soft tissue image photograph, this has a lot of medial involvement. This is probably going to require a flap, so you have to make sure the vascularity would support that. And then one, once I have infection management, once I have soft tissue, uh, uh, a soft tissue viability with or without a flap, only then I would consider some kind of fusion plan for this. And this is gonna be, this is a bone, this is a segmental bone loss, but the distal piece being very attenuated. So yeah. I don't, I frankly don't think the joint is salvageable. This is something that I would consider managing with, if, it, if it's clean, managing with with bone graft uh, uh, around the retrograde uh, hind foot nail or something like along those lines. I'd have to, I have to look at it at that time. Bonnie, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with Dr. Rodriguez with um, putting in a spacer. Um, and then if, if I had my pick of implants, I, I would do an, an antibiotic coated nail and just and put it up from the heel. He has some um, evidence of some subtalar arthritis, I think, from the CT scan anyway. So, and it sounds like the patient really is um, firm about not wanting an external fixator. So it's, it's working within the limits of that as well. It's also the, the, the comment on returning to sports. I mean, this patient needs to have uh, expectations adjusted, right? Because it's not going to be a a, the, the, the ankle joint that he experienced before. I don't know, I can't recall what his age was, but this, this, these are things that 35. Need, need to be communicated with, with the patient. He, 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 it, it is possible that this limb will be salvaged, but it will be fused by the time it's all done. And it'll be a good part of a year, if not longer, until we know what the outcome will be. All right, this is what happened. Um, I discussed this option with him. So I I was thinking of a stage surgery and see how it goes. So in surgery, I rolls were removed. The fracture was clinically united under uh, uh, image intensifier. 
I did small and long needed incision over the, the distal tibia where the swelling is, and a small amount of bus came out. I did the aggressive uh, debridement. But before that, I took swab, was taken for cultural sensitivity, and I did a lot of uh, good debridement, <coughs> aggressive. And um, I removed the rest of the external fixator. Uh, I did some dressing because it was the ankle was solid, it was moving because of my union, you can see. And the patient the following day, when I went to see him in the room, he was happy, comfortable that he's not having any saying that the pain, the pain is much less. I actually encouraged a little bit and I asked him to step on it using crutches. And he wasn't, he, he felt okay. He wasn't uh, still, is, uh, is not, still not cautious about walking, but there was no pain. So I discharged him on uh, an GC and broad spectrum antibiotic to be followed up and he still hasn't come back to me yet. But um, uh, that's, that's what I found actually. I just, um, maybe in the future, but he's just happy with, with, remove, with all that was done to him so far. And so his, his wound is still, you're still just doing dressing changes and the wound is deep? No, is I, he, he came, uh, clean, the wound is clean. Uh, he came back again, the wound is clean. And um, I left a little bit of the wound open and didn't close it. Like, you know, it just was a regular dressing. Uh, but he, uh, generally speaking, I think he was so adamant, also eager to have the extended fixator. As Dr. Rodriguez said, some people get depressed with this and. And really, he was at that stage. Yeah. So I even I didn't give what any 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 cast or any uh, any any praise on that. He was just using crutches and partial weight bearing for uh, for now. Like tough case. Well, I'll be interested to hear what happens when he comes back to see you if he's still happy with his outcome. Yeah. Because if he's not happy, then that's a long road to go down. As uh, Dr. Rodriguez and Dr. Chen just mentioned, you're talking about you know, a thorough debridement, antibiotic cement, doing a fusion stage, you know, all that sort of thing uh, for him to have a leg to my stand issue on. Here was a, my issue here was the infection. So I just, it's a long, long procedure. Like, so I'm just waiting till the infection clear out, then they can discuss more about what other option left. I agree. Unless the infections are done deal, any other discussions can be, can be put on hold for now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, well, we're, we're running a little short on time, so I just wanna give enough, uh, we'll go a little over if that's okay with everybody. Uh, Dr. Zayad, are you okay uh, giving your presentation now? Yes. All right, so go ahead. You can share your own screen if you like. Would you like to share yours or would you like me to share it? Yes, no problem, I will share from here. All right. Is it clear slice like clear for you? Okay. Uh, it hasn't come up yet for me. Now we can see your screen, but the but the slide the slideshow hasn't come up yet. Yeah. Dr. Kevan, you give me a permission or not still? Uh... Your 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 screen is being shared, but your slides are not coming up. All I see is your folder. Dr. Zayad, just for the purposes of keeping things moving, why don't you just let me share your slides and then you can tell me to, uh, to advance and, and, and so on. Is that okay? Okay, no problem. All right. All right, there we go, go ahead. Okay. To, uh, because the time is too late, go through the history of the patient, 29 years old, male patient, healthy, had history of fall down from height, okay, about four months ago. Uh, on examination, swelling, chemosis, tenderness, and uh, not diabetic, not hypertensive. Uh, uh, this x ray, at the time of presentation, showed that there was. Uh, Intraarticular fractures uh, to uh, complete uh, C, uh, 3A out classification C, 
complete uh, interarticular fracture, complex type, okay, C3. So uh, what an AB and letter view. Uh, so the what is the plan and measure this, such a case? So I think we've gone over this a lot now. Uh, perhaps span, scan, and then plan, right? Yes. 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 Okay. We just first. Uh, just to apply the delta frame as external fixation as to ligament flexes, span the uh, so, uh, minimize soft tissue and uh, um, uh, enhance and uh, easy for uh, definitive management uh, three months after three weeks, three weeks of this uh, ex external fixate. Okay, we'll do CT scan after the temporary delta frame. Uh, axial, sagittal, and coronal. We we, we see here uh, a multi-fragmented uh, fracture and lateral and uh, medial. There is a metaphysial area here, defect in uh, distal tibia metaphysial area. Okay, so what's the plan for the definitive management in such a case? Dr. Chen, how would you approach this? I was going to ask um, our everybody actually. So, um, if I recall from the X-ray initially, I mean, it looked like the there was a pretty large posterior pilon piece. Um, yeah, and it looked like you were able to get it reduced relatively well um, in the external fixture. It's a little hard to tell from the shadow, but that, I mean, there's a little bit of step off, which is um, definitely acceptable, I think, for the purposes of putting in the X-fix. Um, you know, this, I think you could go both ways. Like some people may consider going posterior lateral and fixing that posterior piece, but that means you have to put the patient either prone or lateral and then flip them back over to um, plate anteriorly. Um, my usual preference for these actually, because I anticipate this person will get arthritis or, you know, a P-line just usually has um, poor outcomes in that sense that I may definitively have to manage them either with an ankle replacement or a total um, ankle fusion. Um, so I actually, if I can, I like to go with a direct anterior approach because that would be my approach for doing an ankle fusion or replacement anyway. And so instead of having multiple incisions, um, I have a direct anterior and I feel that I can actually see that anterior lateral corner of the tibia pretty well and as well as the joint surface medially. Um, so usually that's my approach to, um, to the pilon. Um, I think, you know, you can put in just as we have seen before an anterior lateral plate, um, you can put in a direct anterior plate. Um, if you need to, if you want to slide kind of a, like a buttress type plate um, medially, I use, I usually do that um, percutaneously. So I open just at the distal medial mal. Um, I found that uh, you can use even a fibular type plate that's lower profile um, because that area tends to be more superficial, slide the plate up, and then you can do percutaneous um, screw fixation more proximally. Um, so that's, if I can, that's usually what I like to do. <laughs> Yes, of course. Dr. Zed, what did you end up doing? Yes, uh, we do uh, did for him well, together with Dr. Uh, Sanad Yunus, uh, my colleague in Athawa Hospital in Al Bayda, Libya. So, did for this patient uh, throw, uh, we got uh, throw by double ablating, uh, throw the anterolateral and direct medial approach to fix the uh, big piece of the medial side. and. Uh, and to lateral metaphysial defect here to the T blades to fix the defect here and the busto lateral uh, fragments and the direct locked blade to the media side to fix the big piece of the media side. This uh, X ray immediately and we uh, let the external fixate of, uh, for uh, two weeks also after fixing the definitive fixation. We let the external fixation to weeks and remove it. Okay, this immediately after the uh, restore the articular surface and uh, fix the will fix the uh, uh, multi fragmented fracture. Mm -hmm. This X ray bust uh, fixation immediately bust fixation. 
So uh, this two months uh, after follow up, when you look here, there's no article says well congruity. Uh, this piece uh, united uh, uh, very well. Okay, a lateral view. This uh, last in last week is this still patient is still in uh, rehabilitation period and follow up. When you look here, there is uh, uh, maybe extra AB not well quality, but uh, articulus is good. Uh, united the fracture, no pain uh, clinically, no pain, not in deafness. And uh, the last uh, clinical picture in uh, rehabilitation uh, in the motion, the range of motion uh, in those reflection and blood reflections, better. This is the uh, scar due to the anterolateral approach in blunt and those reflection by active, by passive better than the active, but uh, we uh, still follow up the patient and in rehabilitation stage. This is the last, in the last week, we, the patient visited me and uh, we uh, follow up together what happened with this patient. This is the final uh, picture. Thank you so much. Thank you, great case. Uh, one question that we got from the audience is, did you use bone graft at all? Yes, uh, the, the defect in the metaphysical area, not the big uh, defect, can, uh, when you enter operatively, uh, restore this uh, fragment and uh, fix it by T blade as you show in, in the, the X-ray. No need, uh, not big uh, defect for, uh, indicated for bone graft. Great, thank you. Um, okay. Well, since, since we're over time here, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Mohamed Gwila to present his case now. Uh, Dr. Gwila, I can present your slides if that's okay with you. Yes, yes, sure. sure. Hello. I think that's a uh, higher, uh, you know? Yes. The slide will be presented by uh, my uh, specialist, Dr. Abdullah Haleti Chala. All right, that's fine. So I, I have the. Yes, yeah. Is this okay? Can I just do the slides for you? Okay, yeah, yeah. okay, okay, you okay. can do that. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this is my case, the Bilon Fraction Hoster of the patient, uh, 45 years old, gentleman, worker, healthy, uh, non smoker, not diabetic, uh, not hypertensive, history uh, full down from height at the uh, worker place in April 2021. Sustained left ankle pain, swelling with deformity, and right knee pain. Uh, and they are at this protocol then local examination, the left uh, distal lower limbs and right proximal tibia repaired swell, swell and deformed with tenderness. No distal neurovascular deficit, both, both limbs. Uh, radically, uh, radiographically, uh, left ankle X-ray uh, at presentation of the patient was uh, left ankle X-ray uh, AB and lateral view both sides. Uh, um, CT scan and the left leg sagittal view was uh, commuted fracture in the distal tibia, uh, intraarticular extended. Uh, uh, was segmented fracture of the fibula. And the, the classification, uh, Rudiagor uh, type 3, and the O classification, uh, Antarctic uh, comminution type uh, C3. Associated with the contralateral, uh, contralateral uh, right knee uh, tibia plateau fracture. Diagnosed closed left uh, balloon fracture and the closed right uh, TV plateau so scar type five. Management first uh, step spanning uh, both of the patient and the external fixator, uh, both spanning the left ankle joint hybrid uh, external fixator and the right side spanning of the external fixation. Uh, CT scan was spanning, was highly commuted still. 
tibia fracture or the segmented fracture of the fibula was spanning in the right knee uh, regular follow up the skin condition is good inflammatory market uh, turned it going down and we planned for definitive surgery uh, the best approach uh, surgical approach or production tendon fixation done by LCB, distal tibia, medial, medial blade augmented by screw throw and through medial approach in the distal tibia, directed lateral approach in the, uh, the distal fibula. Distal fibula. Most uh, operative fix ray. Showing. Uh, AB uh, and lateral for the still fixation by uh, local LCB and uh, augmented by cannulated screw and directly lateral, uh, laterally fibula fixation by DCB blade with syndesmosis screw. Uh, X ray after three months. Uh, well, assuming uh, fibula is healing and uh, showing the site of the healing. This uh, video for uh, uh, showing in the left ankle motion after uh, after three months from surgery and good uh, skin. Uh, no swelling, no signs of infection. And no pain. Thank you. That's great. Excellent case. Another very, very tough injury that was very well managed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, any any comments? I th I think that was it. Yeah. Very challenging, well done case. I think to point out a couple of things for if um, any of the registrars are on the line. Um, I think I would agree with fixing the fibula in this case because it's very length and stable. I think to get your reduction even for the pilon, it's very helpful to uh, fix, reduce um, the fibula. And I really appreciate your point about the syndesmosis screw. I think sometimes we don't always think of the syndesmosis disruption in a pilon fracture, uh, but in this case, again, with higher fibular involvement um, more proximally, um, and the fact that I think you notice that and um, address the syndesmosis, I, I think um, it's, it's really great. And I think the, the trainees um, also to just so to point out, to be aware of that. Yeah, very, very nicely done. Mm -hmm. um, the, the only points that I would make is the CT scan be before the external fixator was applied. I don't know how useful that was necessarily, um, unless you had been thinking about maybe doing uh, an open approach instead of um, fixing it, uh, instead of putting this, this, the uh, X-fix on. As I think Dr. Rodriguez and Aaron had mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes just getting this, the the X fix on and then sending it to the CT scanner saves some resources, saves an unnecessary CT scan potentially. Um, but uh, but otherwise, I thought that was great. It's a tough case. I mean, it showed, uh, you know, the case that Dr. Rodriguez uh, uh, presented. Even after you had the external fixator on, it was still difficult to get reduction of the fracture pieces. It just goes to show like what a complex injury that was. So I think that you did a very nice job. Uh, Dr. Lorena, any points that you wanted to make? I'm oh, sorry. Um, you know, I think um, um, we'll, we'll agree with Bonnie regarding uh, fixing the fibula. And um, usually um, I feel like um, with, the, this, um, with these fractures, I always I try to think ahead the same way that Bonnie is thinking to do an anterola. Like I try to do more like an anterolog approach and um, thinking if the patient needs uh, future surgeries. Yeah, thinking about the future fusion and that sort of thing. Um, the other point that I wanted to make based on what Dr. Rodriguez's presentation was all about, if you're not gonna be fixing the pilon and all you're doing is putting on an X fix and sending it to a colleague, then don't be starting to make incisions and put in hardware 
uh, and making it more challenging for the person who's going to definitively treat the patient. So always be thinking, this is for the trainees, always be thinking about what the next step is, who's the next person who's going to manage this, uh, and how do I not burn any bridges? Uh, that's very important. Um, well, anyway, I thought these were all excellent cases. Uh, I'll just share my screen here so that we can finish up with, uh, with a few slides. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for participating in another very lively conversation. We went a little over time because we had so many fantastic cases from the Libyan side today. And I really want to thank all of our Libyan colleagues for that. Um, I'm sorry that there wasn't even more time to do discussion because I'm sure that we could have learned a lot more uh, speaking together. Uh, so thank you to all of our faculty from the Harvard and the Libyan side. Um, so as we did last week, we have a post test. You can scan this with your, uh, with your phone. Uh, there's also a link here. Aaron will share the link in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, please do complete the post test. Everybody who finishes the post tests for each week and attends these sessions will get a certificate of participation. Our next session will be next Saturday, uh, October 16th. We will be uh, talking about tibial plateau fractures, tibial shaft fractures, open tibia and soft tissue reconstruction. Uh, really some fantastic lectures have been recorded uh, for this coming week. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Fadel, which many of you will know already from Egypt, uh, will be talking about Ilizarov for open fracture. Um, uh, Dr. Kayrod, Dr. Rodriguez will be talking about tibial shaft fractures. Uh, Dr. Paul Appleton, who is a colleague of uh, Dr. Rodriguez at, uh, um, at Harvard, We'll be talking about tibial plateau and then Dr. Sami Dolatshahi will be talking about orthoplastics, complex reconstruction, really fantastic presentation, uh, very comprehensive. Um, so thank you again, as always, for joining us. If there are any questions, please feel free to email us. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.